it's funny. I see that we're doing stuff. So we had a survey that out to all the questions. And our corporate headquarters is good at 865. I'm going to put Sweet at 865. i and I did see that. I did notice that. Okay. Well, I've got I've got ten twenty eight, so we're closing in on it. John, are you about ready? You're good? 29 from the satellite. Okay. All right. Good, good morning, everyone. Can, can you hear me? I've got the, uh, the air conditioning on. It was pretty warm in here. We're trying to cool it off, but if you cannot hear, we can turn those off for a while. <laughs> and uh, and then we'll see how warm it gets, and we can turn them back on. But if you're if you can hear, uh, we'll leave them on for now. I see thumbs up. Okay, let us know if for any reason, Jerry. Just speak up. All right. I don't know if we've got anything worth saying, but you know, we'll be there. Okay, I will call the meeting to order. Uh, we are live, and that little bebop there should tell you that we are also on go to meeting. The GoToMeeting mic is open, and we are recording this meeting. Um, with that preamble, I'll turn over to Mr. Niebling, okay. Secretary Niebling, for certification of quorum. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I can certify that a quorum is present with all board members in attendance, and that the board members were properly noticed at the meeting. In addition, uh, let me add that the agenda for the meeting was posted in the lodge lobby and on the uh, TACA website about 10 days ago. Thank you. Um, moving on to the approval of minutes for the last two meetings. Very well. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I um, have uh, uh, provided minutes to all of you in advance of the meeting for you to review and would at this point submit uh, for your uh, action the minutes of the meeting of January 26, 2018 and the minutes of the uh, Special meeting on March 13, 2018. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes as presented by the secretary? I make a motion to approve. Second. Scott with the second. Jim, Jim. Got it. We have a motion and a second. Any comment from any of the board members? Okay. All in all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion passes, seven is a zip. Okay, uh, make just a few opening comments. Um, first of all, uh, for those on GoToMeeting, this is a listen session. Uh, you may type your comments or questions to Gary, and he will uh, insert those into the flow of the discussion at the appropriate time as best he can. Um, Gary, can you share with us uh, approximately how many folks we have online? Three. And That's pretty approximate, but we can deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> Who, Thank who's online? Uh, who's Leanne Bodie, Jan Young, and Ron Hyman. Okay. Ron must have a twin. Um. <laughs> no, I just like screenshots. Okay. So we, we are good. Um, welcome to uh, a pretty full house this morning. Glad to have everybody here. Uh, we've got a, an interesting agenda, and we've got some important things to update you on. We'll keep moving, um, and hopefully we'll be able to cover everything that we need to cover uh, in a relatively short amount of time. Um, let me first say uh, to Kathy, welcome. John mentioned our special meeting. Uh, at that special meeting, Kathy was elected to the board, and uh, we are pleased to have her join us. 
Uh, she will make a small presentation later in the day, but I encourage each of you to uh, stop and say hi as you uh, get a chance during the day. Uh, I know she's looking forward to meeting some additional folks around the community. Um, next thing I would like to mention, kind of in that same theme, is this is an important time of the year. Uh, by September, at our September board meeting, before the September annual meeting, or at, at, at the September annual meeting, we will actually elect new board members. We will have three board positions available uh, for election this coming September. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the process of electing board members later in the day. But, uh, we have three seats that will be open on a seven-person board. Each of those three uh, folks elected will serve for a three-year term. Uh, we encourage each of you to think about service, either in volunteering, serving on a committee, or running for the board. And uh, if uh, you'll, you'll hear enough later in the day to understand how to do that, if that's something that you want to do. Would also mention, and this is kind of reinforcing something that Gary's already sent out, we have added recycling here on the property. Um, I actually figured out where the recycling bin is this morning. Um, for those of you who haven't yet located it, grab Gary or me or Ron was with me. So some of us know where it is, but uh, we have uh, limited recycling. Um, just as an aside, it's probably a terrible time to start recycling. Apparently all of our recycling activities as a country have fallen out of favor with the Chinese, and the Chinese took about 90% of our recycled material. So right now, the ability to recycle is not a very positive economic experience, uh, but we are uh, at about $200 a month, not a terrible amount of money, 150. Uh, we will provide recycling here. Uh, we encourage everybody to use that and to recycle as best they can. Uh, if you've got long-term renters and you trust them not to abuse the privilege, encourage them to use it. Um, and we will try and police it so that half of the northern half of the county doesn't find their way to our recycling facility. Um, Did you want Gary? I know you sent out an email, but you want to have him provide a summary of what they can. And um, actually, on the last thing on the agenda of reports is we'll do it then, we'll do it then okay, I think. Sure. Um, we will talk later in the day um, about... Uh, where we are on water, uh, where our negotiations are with, with Glacier, and, and uh, also some aspects of our current water situation. Uh, as many of you noticed, uh, it's pretty dry out here. We're going to talk some about communications. Um, but before we get into those reports, which will be basically this afternoon after we take a lunch break, the first item on our agenda is actually the Glacier update. So I will turn it over to Joe, and I encourage everybody to give you his attend, give you give Joe your attention, as he's going to update us on uh, the startup of the fitness center, and that may require each and every one of us to take some action. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, you received an email blast from Gary Prisby recently uh, with much of this information. Uh, in case you didn't get it, or just to reinforce it all. Um, uh, Glacier reports that the progress on the pool and fitness facility, which was scheduled to be open this weekend, has been delayed. Um, not surprisingly, they've got a lot going on over there, and um, we were we were given uh, information a couple of weeks ago that the facility would now be opening mid to late June, uh, and that has further been pushed out to Fourth of July weekend. 4th of July is not a weekend, it's on Wednesday this year, but 4th of July. So we expect the facility to be fully open uh, on or about the, uh, uh, the first week in July. Um, it, if you've driven past, you see all the work that's going on over there. The fencing just went up and um, the pools are all in the ground uh, and they're being, uh, the decking is in place around uh, the outdoor pool and the outdoor uh, hot tub, jacuzzi. Um, a good way to see that is if you go up the central, uh, the uh, south tower uh, elevator and then climb the stairs to the fifth floor, you get a nice view down there of the outside area and you can see the progress. Um, so, uh, so they're working on it and there's a lot going on. The exterior of the extension of the building is being sited and they're working inside 
we haven't been inside the building, haven't been privy to uh, getting a tour or anything to see what's going on inside and how the progress is there, but they tell us it's moving along. Um, the hours of operation for the facility when it opens are going to be 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., and it's going to be staffed 100% uh, of that time uh, with uh, people at the desk and uh, people doing whatever they do over there. Towels will be provided. I'm sure they'll be checked out, and you'll have to return them so you're not charged for them later. Um, and Glacier Club will be issuing ID cards, keys for each member. These will, these will be similar to the Onity keys that we have for our uh, unit entries. Um, but the important thing to uh, know about that is these keys come from Glacier. They will not come from our front desk. Our front desk will not have the capability to uh, duplicate these keys, replace them, code them, anything. You'll have to go to the uh, fitness facility front desk to deal with that if, uh, if that's needed. Um, there's... There's been multiple meetings uh, to date between Josh uh, Cagna and uh, Jim Finnegan uh, of the Glacier Club and uh, with Gary Prisby and Heather Dawson, and they've been working on logistics of uh, how our owners will uh, get their memberships activated and, and how they'll get access and uh, I guess a whole bunch of different logistics things were discussed, right, Gary? Yeah. Um, Jim Finnegan tells me that based on experience, they anticipate they'll run into a few minor unanticipated operational challenges when they open. You always do when you're doing something new, and they'll learn a lot this first year. So they're asking for uh, consideration of their, their stumbling a little bit uh, on that. And so there you go. And... I expect everybody's wondering when they're going to start seeing a bill for their membership dues. Uh, based on the fact that the, uh, the projected opening is on or about the 1st of July, uh, third quarter will be the first full billing cycle, and those bills, those uh, statements will be going out sometime next month in anticipation of opening on, uh, on or about the 4th of July. And that's all I've got. Like I'll say, just for anybody who might be a new owner in the last six months, do um, you have any guidance as to how they might get plugged into this before startup? Well, they can go to our website. All the information on membership is there. Okay. It's on the uh, it's on the Glacier Club page, and um, if you have any uh, if you have any questions about membership, the names and phone numbers of the uh, contacts over at uh, over at Glacier are uh, are there. Are there any own new owners here that that haven't been exposed to this opportunity yet? Yeah. And you're uh, are you are you look are you wanting to look into membership? I am. Gary's been helpful. He's provided the information. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Gary's the guy you want to talk to. Uh, <laughs> I've talked to Ken. Uh, yeah. Ken Ken Stone works for Glacier, and he's also a taco owner. Yep. I so. Bet. He's been helpful as well. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions, Ron? A couple of logistic questions. What do you anticipate will be the methodology for our rental guest to obtain access to the uh, facility? Gary, was that discussed in your meetings with uh, with Heather? Yeah. Short term. Short term. Short -term rental. When they check in at the front desk, Heather, Heather was here. When they check in at the front desk, they will. There's going to be some form that gets filled out, which they then take over their first visit to the fitness facility. They go to their front desk, and that's where they're going to get their keys, limited access key, limited access keys, and that form will have the the dates of their stay, et cetera, et cetera. Just like when they check, they're, basically they're going to have to check in twice: once at their front desk and then once at their front desk. No problem. An important aspect of that is that if you are an owner who has your unit in a rental pro in a short-term rental program, and you have a social membership in the club facility, your rental guests will get access to the club facility and will be assessed a a resort fee. Okay, if you do not have a social membership in the club facility and you have rental guests, 
they will not, under any circumstances, have access to the club facilities. Nor will they pay that. Nor will they pay the dollars. resort fee. So. Next question. Um, having been in retail for most of my life and dealing with parking and so forth, having been a member so far of, of Glacier, I call it Glacier White, if that's offensive, please forgive me. Um, I immediately received a, a parking sticker along with my membership so that, in fact, Glacier could identify me as a, an automobile that was authorized to be in their parking area. Knowing that they have 100 parking places with Valley, knowing that we have swapped some parking places for property and that they have added parking along our entranceway, also seeing so far that their main entrance is certainly the shortest entrance of walking from a parking lot to the main door for the access to the fitness center is basically adjacent to our entry portage. I would imagine that the general public, until they're trained, will end up parking as close as they can to that. Once the parking of the Valley Club is exhausted, I just have a feeling that they're going to be spilling over into lodge parking, which is already short. There's a lot of there's a lot of moving parts to your question. Let me see if I can boil it down a little bit. If you live in the lodge and you're a Tamaran owner, park in the lodge parking lot. Understand that, right? If you're a Tamaran owner and you live in High Point, Pine Cone, and Gamble Oak, awesome. and you want to go to the Valley Fitness Facility, park in the Valley Fitness Facility. Why not? Understand that. How about members that are not Tamron owners and haven't received this message from you as to parking in the Valley Fitness Center, how are we protecting, what methodology have we developed to protect our parking? Do we not well, have parking stickers? Are we not going to police parking? We, it, our agreement with Glacier, our agreement with Glacier, so you're talking about non Tamron owners. Well, that's the primary yeah. person that, of course, we, any that Tamaran, you can't communicate with. Any Tamaran owner can park in any Tamaran parking lot. Fully understand period. that, but we're very so limited, let's not, as you know, So let's parking. not talk about them, because they're not, they're not We can't stop either. them from parking in the lot. Would you please let me finish? So we're talking about non-Tamaran owners. This would be Glacier Club members who live in the back. This would be off-property Glacier Club members. Our agreement with Glacier specifically states that the parking for those people will be in the valley parking lots only, not in our, not in our lodge parking lot. So then let me just get a, a, a direct answer. So we at this time have no plans to police or restrict anyone from parking in the, the lodge if parking we, area. If we see people parking there in our lodge parking lot that don't belong there, we'll raise the issue. Okay. We don't have a, do we have a, a procedure for policing it? No. I think it's premature to be concerned about it. We can always put signage up if we feel like there's a yeah, Well, we hope for their success from the from day one, and it's middle of summer, so. Now, I'll bring this back to our meeting, too. We got Thank you. <clears throat> okay, any, any other questions, any other items to cover relative to Glacier, Joe? Is that it? Okay, uh, next item on the agenda um, for John uh, to talk about the schedule of events uh, for what we call the annual meeting week, which includes a lot of things. Yeah, and the election. And the election, including and, the election. And I prefer to talk about the schedule for the election first, if okay. that's okay. Um, the, the election will be held on the day of the annual meeting. And as most of you know, uh, the annual meeting is scheduled to be held on September 7th. Um, now, backing away from that, trying to give uh, owners uh, and the board and uh, our accountant appropriate times to uh, process ballots, et cetera, and so on and so forth. So I'm suggesting that we can start this process with a letter that goes out, uh, a physical letter that goes out to all owners. It will also have, we'll also have website, uh, on the website, information on the website. Uh, e-blasts and so on and so forth, but basically starting the process June 8th and sending out the, just announcing if you're interested in in running for the board, uh, respond to this letter. Uh, you can nominate someone, you can nominate yourself, um, 
we have typically asked for a, a letter of interest with a resume optional. And unless the board wants to see that changed, that's what the letter will say. Um, and it will give it will give uh, anybody who's interested in running for the board, it will give them uh, a schedule of the deadlines that they have to meet to be considered. Um, and so, uh, basically, in the past, we've given people about a month. So I was going to suggest that um, July 6th be the deadline. That's that's about a month. Uh, give people a month to respond. And those letters do have to go to Elliott Meadows. They do have to be delivered by, in other words, not postmarked, but delivered by 5 p.m. Uh, Mountain Daylight Time on July 6th. That would be the, the schedule we would use. Um, and then any letters that do not make that deadline, those names will not be included on the ballot. Uh, around August 3rd, we will mail out the ballots. Um, just, I mean, just to be clear, yeah, a letter yeah. also includes an email. Is that yes, correct? A, a, an email can be, yeah, yeah in, in our world today, an email <laughs> is as good. Yep. I'm not sure a Twitter works, but uh, <laughs> a tweet, I'm not sure a tweet works. Please, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, certainly a letter or a, a written communication. Yeah. Um, and um, around August, and once we get all those in, then we collate, the, the copy and collate, work with the printer uh, to get the ballots ready, and uh, work with Gary very closely on this uh, to put together uh, packets that would then go out to all owners. They would include the candidate statements and resumes, proxy forms, return envelope, Official notice of the meeting, schedule uh, of annual meet, annual meeting uh, week events, and then we have included a webmaster statement. And Joe, you used to do that. Gary, are you doing that? Now? Are you the webmaster? Yeah, he's the webmaster. <laughs> <laughs> and, and all it was was reminding people that if they had a change in their email address, to email it, or physical address. Yeah, that we're asking them. It's a good opportunity to ask owners. To update their information, so we'll include that, assuming that yes. you think so. Yes, sure. <clears throat> I'm going to suggest a deadline for mailed-in proxies of August 29th. Um, that's about a week before the election, and this gives Elisa uh, down at Elliott Meadows a chance to verify that they're legit. I mean, she's got a she's got a list of official signatures, and she matches those signatures. We, you know, we wouldn't want anybody trying to send in a bogus proxy. Deadline for mailed-in ballots would be 5 p.m. Uh, on September 5th. Uh, so if you're not going to attend the meeting and not going to vote at the meeting, the, you need to get your ballot in. Owners would be asked to have their ballots in on the 5th. That's two days before the meeting. And that gives, um, again, gives Elisa a little time to, to uh, work with all that mail. And then on September 7th at the annual meeting, uh, that is the point at which the, the ballots are actually counted and the uh, election results are announced at that meeting. Now, I don't need the board to approve that as such. I mean, uh, I'm not looking, I, I don't want to put in stone that the letter has to go out this day or that day, but basically that you are in general agreement that this schedule would work. Any comments or questions? Okay. The one thing that is necessary today, as I mentioned to some of you earlier, is um, the board does need to officially designate August 7th, or excuse me, September 7th, as the date of the annual meeting, since the bylaws say that the annual meeting will occur on the second Friday of September, unless the board designates another day. So to be in accord with your bylaws, the board should designate September 7th as the annual meeting day. I'm going to make that motion. So that require a motion. Second that, that's, that needs to be done, yes. So, John, just to be clear, we also have to deal with the new owners meeting as well, right? Does that um, be part of the motion? I would not. Okay. No, you've got more flexibility on that. Okay, so I'll make a motion that we, um, uh, that we schedule the annual owners meeting for September 7th. Uh, I don't know if we need to talk about time, but normally start about 10 a.m. It, it's actually my laws to start at 10 a.m. Yeah, okay. So I'll follow the rules. So we have I'll a second. motion. And Rick is the second. 
to host, to have the annual meeting on September 7th. Okay, any discussion? This is what is posted on the website as a, as a proxy or placeholder. All of the meetings are proxy or placeholders until they actually happen, until immediately before. But, okay. Um, so and you, is there's a motion? Motion and second. I have no other comments, so I'll call the vote. And all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Very well. Okay. Um, so that will appear in the minutes. It's the seventh. Um, now, the other thing to talk about today, and I'd sent out a couple of possible uh, schedules for the annual meeting week, and I've had some feedback from board members uh, that the preference, as I understand it, and, and what I'd like is, you know, again, a general acknowledgement that this is what you all would like. I don't think it really requires a motion here, but as I understand it, what the board would like to see happen, uh, given the fact that the annual meeting must be, the owner's meeting must be on the 7th now, okay, that you want to have your board meeting the day before. Is that, that's what I think I heard. Yeah, that's correct. Yes. Um, there will also be, even though it's not required, <laughs> there's a, a traditional owner's reception that we've done on Thursday night before the owner's meeting on Friday, and I assume that the board is still <coughs> positive about having that event. Yeah. Very well. And then finally, the one thing that you do have to do sometime during the year is a new owner's orientation. And that can be any time you want it, as many times as you want it. But it has traditionally been done that week because that's a convenient time to have it. So I, I believe, as I understand it, the board's pleasure is to have that meeting, a new owner's orientation this year, to have that an hour before the owner's meeting at 10. Correct. Yes. Is everybody? Yes. Is that everybody's recollection? That they, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I guess I would say, you know, maybe start at 8:30 so that we, you know, have okay. a few minutes. I mean, I want, I don't want to back to back, but yes. Okay. Okay. okay then, then um, these events then will appear on a schedule for the annual uh, meeting because now the annual meeting, the events are going to be basically on Thursday and Friday, and that will be included in the packet as we have discussed today. Okay. Yep. Okay. That's all I need. And just from, from a housekeeping standpoint, the annual meeting will be held across oh, the parking lot. Good point. Good point. Um, yeah. For as part of the agreement that we executed, uh, we have that facility forever at no cost. Uh, so the meeting will be over there. Um, <clears throat> we haven't talked much about a golf tournament, but we hope to host a golf tournament. You, you, had a you left with, out the two most important things, John. <laughs> well, John's not counting. Kind of What's the other things. one? <laughs> the pairings party. Oh. Well, <laughs> you want to talk a little bit about We have typically had a pairings party on well, Friday I asked, night. I asked John yesterday out in the parking lot who's going to run the golf tournament. He says, you are. <laughs> <laughs> so what part of that didn't you understand? <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, we'll be having the golf tournament again this year. It'll be on Saturday the 8th, right? Uh, I'll be confirming arrangements on that with uh, with Glacier Club. Uh, we did get on. We had a little snafu on the on the on the calendaring last year, but we got that squared away. And and the fix was we got to play on the mountain course last year. We'll be back on the valley course this year, and we were calendared well in advance this time. So it's all set up, and uh, there'll be information coming out in the owner's packet. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll include the golf. Yeah, but it, uh, pretty much the same as it's been in years past. Are you a golfer? I try. You signed up, huh? I try. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we all, a lot of us do that. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, we'll be having our, our golf tournament again. We'll have the pairings party and the uh, after golf. Uh, uh, Awards. Uh, that's, where we give, that's where we give Gary the trophy again. Over here in the yellow card. Well, he didn't <laughs> no, get it last year. He give it to Larry. <laughs> he didn't get it, it last to year. Larry Mears. <laughs> he, his run of two, his run of two consecutive wins was broken last year. So that's right. So Larry's got three consecutive wins. And he I, keeps reminding me his middle name is Three. 
And while it's a while while the pairings are a random draw, there has been accusations of some, you know. Uh, no. Uh, so. Anyway. Stand back. <laughs> I would like for the board to look into that if you would. <laughs> wouldn't make that kind of accusation. We have a special district attorney that will look into that. Yeah. We'll get back to you. Okay. Uh, real quickly before I go to the next, I heard a couple of blips. How many are we online now? Are we still at three? Um, no, we were up to one, two, three, seven, okay. but we're down to, I think, four. Wrong numbers, huh? Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Five. Oh, six. Jerry, 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 Jerry. Okay. Uh, Jerry, keep Jerry? the question. Uh, quick question on uh, the annual meeting week. Uh, any plans or thought uh, about uh, town hall uh, this year uh, or we candidates uh, kind of thing that we've had in the past? We talked about it. I mean, I, last year I think we had like we decided one question or something yeah, like that came out of that. One question for the candidates. Yeah. So we um, one of the so from, just from a history perspective, what we had done the last several years is we actually had a board meeting on Wednesday, and then an open day in the middle where we did a, a kind of a town hall. Uh, the last couple of years, those have really shrunk from an attendance and also um, time that we were doing it perspective. Um, so we looked at it and said, why do you know why do we have a three day window for the meetings uh, and have people come in on a Wednesday uh, for the board meeting, or typically they're sticking around because it's the holiday, uh, and then kind of have a somewhat of a dead day on Thursday. So we tried to compress that. Uh, so the thought was to have the the new owners meeting uh, in the you know in the morning, and, and we could certainly talk about having a town hall as part of that if it, if they were interested in doing so. Um, I don't know. You have any thoughts on? I, well, I think that's again the town hall as you recall is not a board event the town right. hall is actually hosted and sponsored by the owners um i would certainly be interested in maybe talking to some owners about maybe something wednesday night if people are you're going to be here thursday morning you're going to be here wednesday night right if it's going to be an owners meeting and yeah, maybe maybe if candidates are so inclined they can um show up and chat and maybe answer a few questions i don't know i don't, I don't want to get into too much about managing either the town hall uh, or the get to, you know, because that's really a, I think that should be each individual candidate's choice, either to participate or not participate in something like that. But making a forum available, I have no, no problems with that. We'll see if there's any interest in doing that. Okay, next on our agenda, uh, property report and uh, the acting head of the Architectural Review Committee. Okay, we'll start with the property report. <clears throat> um, the grounds, uh, as most of you know, Taryn has been our full-time year-round employee for a lot of years now. She's still here. The seasonal employee uh, is actually Cody. This is his third year returning. Uh, probably his last year he graduated from Fort Lewis this year. And this will probably be his last summer, but he's been a great help. And Mike, who works part time, kind of filling in wherever we need him. Uh, we did just complete a water shutdown uh, as requested by Glacier Club. <clears throat> so we were down for about four days. Uh, don't think it really hurt anything too much, but it did. We did aerating. We couldn't uh, fertilize behind it because we couldn't water. But we'll get that back on track now that we can get the water on. <clears throat> we did purchase our own aerator instead of renting so we could have a little more flexibility and timing and not kill ourselves off in three days trying to run all over the property. Uh, if you've been in Pinecone, you notice a few holes. We've been trying to track down a leak that got slowed up because of the water shutdown, but uh, we're hoping to track that down, repair the leak, and get all those filled in. And next week, Karen will start her flower purchases and doing all that following up the place like she used to do. Um, the spring heater PMs, we're just wrapping that up. Uh, <clears throat> Mark, Curtis, and Jesse have gone to all the units, except the ones we pressed that we don't to uh, check water heaters and replace uh, filters. Mailboxes, we've completed the lodge, uh, Pinecone and High Point, and Gamble Oak is scheduled for this summer. We are, uh, which Gary has sent out notices, Considering a couple different options on that. So if you have any questions, uh, you can get a hold of Gary. Uh, otherwise, 
either way it goes, we're, we're hoping to complete it this summer. The backflow preventers in Pinecone and Gamble Oak, if you live there, if I remember over the last couple of years, they've put in meters and backflows. In our investigations, we've determined the backflows that we put in really aren't the right ones for our property. So met with Glacier Club. <clears throat> They're going to be installing new ones uh, over the course of the summer. That's going to facilitate or necessitate us shutting down water to each building periodically while they make the changeover. Uh, we will contact <clears throat> ahead of time before we shut the water down. It'll probably be a 9 or 10 in the morning till 4 in the afternoon to shut down. Uh, lodge fire pump. We've had to, we had some issues with it. Uh, we've got Odessa pump coming in next week to do some repair work on it. Uh, that will facilitate us, or once again necessitate us, shutting down the fire system to the lodge. During that time, we'll be doing fire watch. We're hoping it'll only be a one-day shutdown. <clears throat> it may just be one day during the day, but maybe overnight. Uh, if that's the case, we'll have to continue the fire watch uh, through the night also. It shouldn't be anything anybody notices unless there's a fire, uh, but it does have to be done. Uh, the north elevator still scheduled for the fall. <clears throat> um, we have actually started some of the background work. We pulled the uh, furnaces that were in there out and relocated them to a different location in the room so uh, we can do the other work. Uh, met with the fire department, uh, the alarm company, and the electrician, and we're trying to complete as much of the background work as we can, so we're ready in the, in the fall to keep the elevator shut down as short as possible. <clears throat> there are a few items that uh, we're doing value engineering on. Uh, one of them is a shunt trip that's about $25,000 that we're hoping to reconfigure what we're doing to do away with the necessity for that part. Uh, <clears throat> employees, we are getting <clears throat> me, one new night employee. Uh, one of our current employees has asked for fewer days, so if you see a new face at night, that's uh, Ian, uh, the new employee. He just started last week, so he's still in training. Uh, he'll be here two nights a week, so uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, nice if you see him. That's who it is, and bear with him while he's learning the property. Uh, recycling, like Eric uh, mentioned, we actually haven't started recycling yet. Uh, the bins that they found are really only for uh, maintenance employees. We're going to be putting some cans outside in the alcove so we can keep an eye on what's going in there. There'll be four cans and a container for the cardboard. We want to keep an eye on what's going on in there because if the wrong items get put in the large bins, they're just putting them right into the dump truck or the trash truck and it gets thrown away. And we get charged for an extra dump because they, they pull three dumpsters. So we're hoping that the owners will just use the small bins and we'll, we'll keep an eye on them throughout the day and keep dumping them into the, into the larger bins. Uh, as it is, we've already picked glass and plastic bags out of the bins. So we're not off to a great start yet, but we know people haven't been notified. We don't have all our signage up yet. Uh, the Gamble Oak parking lot, uh, it's scheduled for its resealing this year. We did do the crack sealing uh, in the spring. In talking with the contractor, he prefers doing it then. The cracks are open more. You get a better job of sealing. Uh, they'll be back in the fall to complete the sealing of it. They'll also go back in any cracks they missed or have shown up. They'll do that also um, to complete the job. That's pretty much everything I have. Any questions? Of course, any questions from the board? First, on uh, outstanding items, I know there are a couple. Go ahead, Joe. Those on the mean itemized. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. On the back backflow preventers in Pinecone and Gamble Oak, uh -huh. are we talking about backflow preventers, PRVs, or both? Well, the PRV, no, not the PRVs. The PRVs not are fine. It's just backflow preventers. They put in what's called an RPZ, and they tend to go. They're a, actually a higher quality, do a better job, but they also tend to dump more water inside our closets with the heater and electrical, we don't want that. So they're changing over to double checks, which is safer in our closet. And um, these are, are these these are in the uh, riser closets, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. And did we did we pay for these or did Glacier? Glacier, did. Glacier paid for them. Yes. We paid for the PRVs. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now in this, there may be some work that we want to get done while the funders are in there working that we may pay for it. But uh, backflows themselves, Glacier Bucks paid for it. Okay. 
of the comments from the board first. Uh, okay, I, I have two. Um, I know we've uh, seen a reoccurrence of uh, some bats in my backyard as well. So they're, they're all around. I saw one last night. Um, so we, we know we have an ongoing issue there. Can you update us on year two of our ongoing program? And secondly, could you talk more about the implications of the water uh, as it affects our property? Um, well, on the bats, yes, we knew they were going to come back. They'd be back there. They tend to go back to the same locations they were previously. If they're sealed out, they'll still come back for years, uh, according to the bat specialist we had. So I think you guys have an issue with them being your soffit, so we'll have to investigate how they're getting in there. And uh, to say we have a formal program, no, we're just until the bat shows where we have to uh, address it, that's where we will. We did continue after the company left last year, and they sealed the first two openings that we knew we had problems. And then we had a contractor continue down through the building, the rest of them, uh, early winter before the weather turned bad. We know we still have some holes we have to hit. Uh, once the weather got too bad to be on the roofs, they had to stop. So that'll be the first place we address is uh, where we know we have some issues in the soffits. Okay. All right. And water? Question. Are you getting the experts back to know how to do this, or are you trying to do it yourself? Like you uh, we're doing both. Well. What are the experts? I haven't talked to them yet. So what I'm hearing is you're not having the guys. Well, we will when we need them, but I haven't spoken to them yet. Water. We just want the board to be aware of how long this is been going on. Over 10 years. And Dave has told us time and time and time again that he's going to take care of this. And we rose a big stink last year to finally get somebody to come out here that knows how to do this. And they told us they would have to come back. And every time we bring this up, it's like, oh, we're gonna we're gonna get some ladders out there and take care of this. And he's he has had no success getting this done. The experts did have some success last year, but, you know, we need people that know what they're doing to take care of this problem. It's, it's you know, they, like you said, they, they, they will get back in, and they're going to get in the entire lodge and we'll get them out of there. They're going to continue to multiply. Well, I think, I think we are aware. I think several of us have our I, own I instances, so I, you're, I you're not unique or you're alone in that respect. I didn't see anything on the agenda about talking about it. I know you brought it up there, and I appreciate that. But. Keep in mind, we just got the email a couple of days ago telling us that they were back, so, and you may have been having yes, discussions here internally. I didn't even but, know last year that this was going on. I had an email with you, and, and, and we didn't do anything about and it. We, and we addressed it after you after that happened. We, I we, know, but I think that's very concerning that's been going on that long, and the board didn't know, the people on the board didn't know anything about it. We've known that we've had bats in and in and out for a long time. Last year, I didn't know that it was as bad as what you had indicated last year. That was news well, to me. We're, we want to be sure the board, everyone on the board, realizes the seriousness of this today and how long it's been. It has not been given the attention it deserves. And uh, it's, it's if we don't get it out of there. And and I don't buy the fact that it can't be fixed. The experts say it can be fixed. It may take time. But this argument that, oh, they're going to get back in well, you have to keep at it. You have to keep at it. When, when we talked about it this morning, just so you know, when we, we talked about it this morning, and the discussion we had was we knew this was a two- or three-year uh, process. Keep in mind, we were redoing the lodge all of last year as well. Uh, I think what, what Dave just said is he plans on getting the experts back out here as well. As, as well as trying to focus and, and identify the you know where they can do it where, where they can focus and do some things as well. This isn't going to this isn't going to fix itself in a year. Based on our history with Dave, he has not followed through on this. Our concern is if we understand it's almost a year and it's already almost two, so why not have he been in contact knowing that people will be coming back? Why? Why? Yeah, we were told last year that that was going to happen. It sounds from what he just says, it still sounds like he's trying to fix this himself. Rather than getting experts on what we can do, wasting time. Okay, we hear you. I, I didn't. I, I didn't, didn't hear. I didn't say hear that. that. No, I heard him say I both. Heard, I heard that the experts were here, and then he had some other people 
Is that about what you said? Yeah. <clears throat> the experts identified some of the issues of the areas of problems we had. So when they did the immediate problems, we continue once we do the problems with local contractors. Who don't know what they're doing. Keep in mind, he's got people on site. For those experts who come out here, they've got to come out, they've got to set up scaffolding. I mean, they can't just do that overnight. So we're going to have both. We're going to have to do them in parallel. We're going to have to have the experts get out here when they can. And we can have room for them to get set up. But he's got maintenance people here that can do work as well. And they've had no success in getting rid of that. We've had nets put up. We've had people try. They, they don't know what they're doing. Well, I disagree. We had. We didn't have the expert. The first time the experts came out, they said there was no use in them coming out. That was prior to the remodel because there were so many holes and bad boards in the building. Once the That's remodel com was complete and we had it somewhat under control, we brought the experts in. That's they not true. They, well, you sat down with us and we had a meeting, some meeting groups, and we agreed to, to not have the experts take part of the remodel. And then they, look, they later told us you've been kicking yourself because you agreed to do that. Because it didn't work. Yes. 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 You said, you yes. said FCI we said, can we can fix this, we do it all the time. That, those are your words. We're not, we're not adding any value here. Uh, he said, well, she said, it's not helping. You've made your point. I, we I'm, hear you. I'm just trying to make a point. And, and, and what I'm hearing is, oh, it's, you know, we're going to take care of it. And that's what we've heard for years and years and years and years. And I just want everyone on the board to be aware that that's what we keep hearing. And he is not taking care of it. Okay. Point has been said. Point has been made. Okay. Water. Anything else on water? Um, just that we know they're redoing the water treatment plant at Glacier Club, and there's going to be periodic times when irrigation is uh, going to have to be shut down. They're going to be filling their tank, shutting down the water treatment plant for work, <clears throat> using just the tank to supply water. During those times, we probably won't be able to irrigate because we now run off of domestic water for irrigation. I don't have schedule. I don't know how much that is, but we know there's going to be that on occasion over the course of the summer. And it's already occurred, is that yes. do I understand? Mm -hmm. We got our first request uh, this week. They asked us Tuesday, I think it was, to shut down irrigation, and then we, we turned it back on today to start irrigating tonight. Okay. So we're going to start watering the lawns again tonight? Tonight. Okay. I got another question. Okay. Were you done? Yeah. 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 Um, I, I was busy making notes and looking at things while you were doing your, well, I was multitasking, listening to your report. Did you talk about mailboxes? Yes. Okay. So, yeah. All right. Any other comments or questions from the board? Okay. Um, I'm hearing no other comments from the board. Are there comments uh, from the audience? Questions? Uh, just a question, sure. being a new owner. Uh, I'm wondering about if there's some uh, uh, information that can be had about the water supplier and the water, the quality of the water that we get. There will be a report on water this afternoon. Um, so I, I think if, if you're looking for background, I think that would be a good place to start. If you have a specific question, we'll try and handle it now. But otherwise, there'll probably be 15 or 20 minutes spent on water this afternoon. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? Any <clears throat> questions online? No. I get yeah. This is Gus von Bolschwing. Yes, sir. Um, this, Dave talked about recycling and not using the bins that are inside the building. Dumpsters. The, the dumpsters. Part of the reason for that is that there's a whole variety of reasons, but on those dumpsters, I think they say they don't don't is Dave still? Yeah, don't yeah. they say they take glass? <clears throat> no, it's yeah, no. a big sign that says no glass. It says no, no glass. glass. Well, there's a big sign that says no glass, but I think on the side of the dumpster itself, when waste management delivered it, those dumpsters were made up when they were still taking glass, and I think it says glass. And just want to make sure that people don't go. We're going to take that out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Somebody's already started using them, so. I think the Is message has. I think the message. That, I think the no glass message has been out there pretty clear. Now some people aren't going to hear it. <laughs> 
I think that, yeah, we might need to put something in the rental units uh, or have the, you know, pack. You talk to Heather about having a reminder that goes to the renters. Because in some years, like in we, gotta, we can't give glass today. Are we got to put, we got to put it out to renters too. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I yeah. think they're going to want to be aware of it. They can't use it. Right. Yep. The, the second thing was, um, th this happens every time we do the mailboxes. I don't know who's listening in here and, and who might, who's here from Gamble Oak, but yes, the mailboxes are mandatory. You're going to get a mailbox if you don't have a mailbox. That's just the way it is. Every time I send out these emails that say you're going to have a mailbox mm -hmm. and then people get charged and three months later, why do I have to have a mailbox? You're going to have a mailbox. This is edicted by the federal, the, yeah. the post office, yes. who is the federal yes. government, who says everybody has to have a mailbox, and or they won't through, deliver any mail. We've been going through this for two, three years now, yeah. so we're finally getting to the end of it. Yes, yeah. that's the way of the world. Okay. okay. I don't know. Any other comments? I was just curious, why no glass? They won't take it. Some recyclers don't process glass. Yeah. There's no economic value. Actually, actually, Phoenix, we can put glass in our recycle because in Phoenix they'll they'll sort the glass out and they they have a way to deal with broken glass. I think a lot of it has to do with broken glass in the in the stream. But, you you uh, can take it down to the recycling center at Durango Tech Center. They will take it. Waste management won't. Okay, Dave, can we talk about architectural review? <clears throat> Um, I only have one item. Here's the letter that was sent. I only have one set of pictures. Do you want to start here? Um, why don't you just describe and then we can all. Okay. What they're requesting is adding a gate on their front porch so their dog can go on the front porch <clears throat> with them out there uh, without running off the porch. They had a gate uh, that we have no record that it was approved. Somewhere along in the process, it disappeared on them. Uh, so they're requesting they can put it back up. The picture shows, the one color picture shows their front deck with the X's where the right hand one on the post is where it's connected and hinged. The left hand one is at the railing that's where it uh, where it latched when it, it was an accordion gate <clears throat> folds back out when not in use. So that's that picture. What unit are we talking about? What owner? Are you uh, seven, 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 one, six. And they also refer to Two, another gate that, that is approved and is installed on property. That's on 801, 802. <clears throat> so the black and white pictures show that gate. It, it's a little bit different situation, but they refer to it, so I have pictures of that also. I will have those pictures. You're different over here. You don't want to go to yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious, Dave, on the on the 801, 802, uh -huh. is that, I won't say 12 steps, whatever it is, is that actually a common element, or is that private property? It's a, I believe that would be a limited common element, like a back deck. Okay. Whereas the one in seven um, down in uh, Gamble, is that that's a limited as well, right? Well, I think that's a common that's element. That's a common that's element. Accessible to everyone. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they treated that yeah. 801, 802, yeah, they've got upper right 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 That unit didn't have a back deck. They treated that as a back deck, even though. In front. Okay. Okay. Well, um, I'll try and facilitate some kind of a discussion here. Um, first of all, we have the question: Do we allow gates? I think I think the applicant is, by omission, admitting that this was never approved by any authority at Taco. Um, so, and as far as I know. With the possible exception of this one in 801, 802, which is a rather unique situation, it's been there forever, um, and which I see has a, you know, kind of, kind of has a safety 
application. I don't know of any other place where we have a, a gate uh, owned by an, or installed by an owner. I don't know whether they owned it or not. Installed by an owner on a common element. Not that I'm aware of. Anybody else aware of a gate anywhere on property? I mean, I. In in fact, we had gates. We had we had at least one gate that I can recall on a back deck that the owner was uh, compelled by the board to remove it to remove because it, yes. it was never approved. I, I do. I know where exactly where that is. Gary knows where it is. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> one down on the end of past John, past where you were at eight fifth on the end. There is that one. There's one there. There is one on the end of on the like north end of that building. Yeah. Oh, really? one there. Yeah. 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 It's just a small gate. But it's a down. it's a gate on and off the entire deck. Yeah. It doesn't block off. No, it doesn't block this, off. This this would block this would off block part of the deck. It would. <laughs> It would, it would eliminate moving all the way through that deck because it cuts across the, the uh, yeah. So did they install it the first time? Did they? I mean, I, I'm just reading through this letter. Eric right? knows the history, I think. <laughs> well, the history is in the letter. Well, it's in the letter, yeah. yeah. It's basically a friend of theirs who was a former member, board member actually, um, who no longer resided here. He moved off property, but he apparently was a contractor. He and a buddy of his installed this uh, some time back, according to the letter. I know nothing of the truth. That's only what the letter says. Um, <clears throat> I can't ever remember being on that deck when it was deployed. When no, I have deployed. been. I've, you I've have seen been. it. Yeah. Yeah. I've actually been uh, delivering voting materials, for example. And it, was I, 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 it was up. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing, and I, I don't mean to make this a, a major point, but the, unfortunately, the dog involved in this story has passed away. Um, there's no longer a dog in, in, in this particular story, as far as I know. And this was a particularly aggressive dog, by the way. Large and aggressive, yes. It, uh, it, it was, it it was it, my yeah. dog. <laughs> um, no, that was it was a rescue dog. Uh, I don't think anybody really understood the history. Um, I we're into a precedent here. Um, I'm not comfortable setting the precedent from my own perspective. I mean, if if they want to bring us drawings and, and a contractor and tell us what they intend to put up, I might be more inclined. Not necessarily, but I might be more inclined to view it. But to just give them a carte blanche, you can put up a gate across a common element, does not strike me as a good precedent. Hey, Eric, I'll just say that. Yeah. Can I go? I have to. Go yes, sir. Okay. I'm. I agree with you. I mean, I don't know what this. It's kind of hard to tell in the picture what this, what the length is, but I'm mm -hmm. sure there are temporary type gates that they could put up if they happen to have a dog with them. There are. I have two. Yeah. So I just have two. <laughs> I just know what I use for my kids. <laughs> Baby gates. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's big folding gates for animals now that are actually some of them are four foot tall. So if I'm out on our front and I want to keep our old dog in, I just take our wooden gate outside and block her so she can't get down the steps. Then you just take it down when you go back in. I do have one concern, and, and only they do mention that you know they have, you know their deck is they're 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 the only ones there. The problem is is you're going to get into individuals who wouldn't have that luxury, and that's where it starts to get a little bit. Messy. See, their, their stairway is, is is a common stairway, not unlike yours. Mm -hmm. right? It'd be like my stairway, mm -hmm. where if I put a gate across that, then my neighbor couldn't get to his unit, right. or he couldn't walk across, right. you know, through that. So I think that's there's a difference there too. Yeah. yeah. Right. We're just concerned we start this, which just goes exactly. it go crazy. Can, be, you know, be careful of the precedent you set. Yeah, I just yeah. it's you know, the war. Who wants gates open? Who wants gates yeah. closed? Yeah, I I mean if we're I mean I I know there probably could be a case made for not even allowing what you do, but if you put it up and it's up there for an hour or two and you take it down and take it back in your house. You know, I think people tend to look the other way, mm -hmm. but something that's permanently attached to the building, that's, you know. Yeah. Got a comment here? <clears throat> but I think it's in the rules and regs that those, even the temporary gates, can't be put up 
probably, it, it probably is. I'm pretty sure it's it's in the you know uh, gates for pets and kids. You can't put up, but I'm pretty sure that's in the rules for eggs. <clears throat> I don't know. I personally well, don't want to see a little kid fall down the stairs. So we got overlooked. I think, yeah, I think wow. safety has some precedent. Here. Right. Okay, but setting aside some of the the, the issues, uh, we have a specific request in front of us for yeah. a gate um, of undetermined uh, design, um, and um, yeah, I think based on the information that we've been given <clears> at this point. And it was only received two days ago, so it's not like we had any chance really to, to go back to the owner and try and get more information. Um, I cannot support this. Well, the owner's out of the country, right? Uh, they're not available to talk to yeah, us. I don't right. know where they are, but but uh, they're not available. Um, so my <clears throat> my suggestion would be to take no action. I agree. I agree. Okay, you're not you're not going to take an action. That's correct. All right. Okay, that completes the uh, the property report and the architectural review. Um, <clears throat> moving on to old business and then new business. Um, I have uh, I have two items uh, of old business that I'll cover first, and then if anybody else wants to. Uh, from the board wants to add in old business, we will cover those. Um, the first item on old business, uh, one we've talked about the last couple of meetings, the owner of two adjoining units here in the lodge has requested a relocation of boundary uh, as allowed by our by section 16 of our DCCRs. Uh, the board considered the request and determined that in their opinion, this constituted a giving up of community property to an individual owner for no compensation. In that circumstance, Section 16 requires an owner vote, as opposed to just a board vote, an owner vote to allow such a giving up. Um, we have been in contact with the owner. The owner has requested an ownership-wide vote, uh, and we're making progress on um, that. Um, we're, in fact, about this close in terms of having an owner vote, but that process is not quite yet complete. So at this point, I can only say that uh, the old matter remains open. Um, any questions from the board? I, I guess I would add further. I expect it to be resolved one way or another within the next couple of weeks, but I don't have a definitive answer today. Um, the second... Um, item of old business was actually one that was submitted by an owner to me. Um, a lodge owner and a dog owner uh, has complained about the lack of a poop station on the north end of the property. It says that I don't live in the lodge, but apparently a lot of dog owners like to take their um, dogs up to the north end to what I'll call Prisby territory. The, the, uh, <laughs> yeah. Gary, Gary was the first to suggest that we might want to own that property. Well, we know it was going to be a dog site. Um, I'm simply going to turn this over to the staff to look at. I don't have a proposal, uh, but dog ownership and taking care of your pets continues to be an issue on this property and, and most specifically at the lodge. And uh, um, So the fix, though, is just putting a station up there, right? Well, the, the fix would be kind of the, well, the suggestion was to do something like what they do down at the golf course. You'd have a dispenser, or bags, yeah. and a bag. Yeah. where you would drop the remains, uh, and then that our maintenance staff would have to come by every couple of days and collect them. Um, not that they don't have enough to do already, but, but we need to do something. So the, so the bag station, the bag dispenser at the at the walkway going up to that area. Further up the hill, yes. And then the trash then cans can. out in, in front of the building are not sufficient? The, the thought is that dog owners are lazy, and that's what the email said, and this is a dog owner, so I, you know, that to make it the easier you make it for a dog owner, the more likely they are to comply. And there is some so, um, so you move you essentially move that one up to right next to the stand with the bags. You put the two two again, and so that that's the only other item I have of old business. Is there any other 
whole business to be nominated by the board. Fair enough. Any old business from the audience? Ron? Yes, returning to the issue of the uh, consolidation request, um, and we'll put this request in writing, but I wanted to, to throw it out on the table this morning. Uh, I understand that, that, as you've said, nearly everything is in order for a ballot. Um, I believe that, that uh, Ken and our attorney has um, have identified the language that you all will accept for the ballot and the accompanying uh, uh, letter of explanation. We provided the most recent plat so that there's no misunderstanding as to what wall is involved between our two units. Um, seeing as we've already been in, in this process for over a year now, and seeing as we have an election coming up in August, and seeing as both the board and all the homeowners would like to see maximum participation in what we, of course, personally see as an important issue, but beyond that I see as a very important issue of consolidation in general, uh, we will be requesting that that ballot be taking place at that same time, either in the packet that is to be mailed out typically in the month of August, or coincident that it be mailed at the same time. I understand that the board has requested that we pay for that mailing. We are willing to do so, whether in fact it's included in the package or a separate mailing. That may defray some of the expenses of the normal August mailing. So that's what I would like to, to throw on the table for your consideration. We'll be putting that request in writing. Okay. okay. We'll, we'll deal with that um, uh, when we see the, see the, re the request. Okay. <clears throat> we'll say, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there at this point. Okay. Um, any other old business from the audience? Any other old business, Gary, online? Can I Too comment on, oh, no. on that dog thing? <laughs> <laughs> can you comment on the dog thing? Sure you can. I'm going to get you a dog. You, you need to. <laughs> That's the last thing I need right now. Um, but what everybody needs to remember is if you do put some sort of receptacle up there, people are going to put all kinds of stuff in it. They're just going to put stuff in it. We've already had a request for a bin to, to go up next to the, the, the barbecue so that people can throw their stuff in there. The problem is we've got critters everywhere here, and they are going to get into it. We had one of the smoker stands <clears throat> start on fire, and when one of the guys opened it up, People had put bags of trash inside the smoker stand. They will put anything anywhere, and it's just going to be a huge pain in the neck to have to go up there, empty that thing out, clean it out, and then take it down to the dumpster. That's all I'm going to say about that. <clears throat> That's exactly why I'm turning it over to staff. There's some <laughs> things I don't understand about it, and uh, I, you know, again, it's. I want owners to give us thoughts and feedback, and I wanted them to give a fair hearing. Um, this was one that had some merit to it. Um, does it mean it's right? It just needs a fair discussion. Another item of old business? Well, I was just um, wondering, I thought last year they were talking about maybe putting a gazebo in that spot. I mean, it's a well, we haven't completed the land swap, so we don't own the land oh, okay. yet. So one one thing at a time. But All right, I um, didn't realize that. Thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> we're waiting for a, a big benefactor to give us some funds <laughs> so we can. <laughs> um, we do have some interesting ideas for that property. I don't mean to diminish that, but we're probably a year ahead of ourselves okay. in terms of that. Okay, uh, last call. Any other old business? Okay, any new business from the board? Mr. Carey. Uh, when I give the financial report later on, you're going to see that there's some money left over from the lodge remodel project that has remained unspent. And uh, I talked to Dave about it, and we have pretty much completed all the all the projects that were allocated as part of that. All the little items that were allocated as part of that caught up with the things that were finished up this past, uh, during this last year, and uh, currently we have 
about close to sixteen thousand dollars left over in the lodge remodel account, and uh, there is also one owner who has not fully paid his special assessment, but he is in the process of paying it down slowly. It's accruing interest, and as long as he keeps paying something, we're kind of letting it slide rather than taking action against him. Okay. He's keeping his other assessments current, so uh, we think that's so. In, at the end of the day, uh, it looks like we'll probably, and if he pays in full, which I expect him to, but not sure when, there'll be about twenty-five thousand dollars remaining uh, for the lodge remodel project. So we can do a number of things with that money. We can we can give it back to the lodge owners, uh, or as I would what I would suggest is that a committee of lodge owners be put together and come up with three, four, five, six things that they'd like to spend the money on and improvements to the building, whether it be inside or outside, and, uh, you know, maybe new deck furniture on the on the uh, central tower deck or up on the north deck or who knows what. Um, come up with some ideas, and if those ideas tend to be but we'll spend the twenty-five thousand. We can, you know, we can decide to do that. If we come up with too many ideas that spend more than twenty-five thousand, we can put it out to the owners for a survey and and ask them what they'd like to have to spend their money on, because it is it is the lodge owner's money. So. Well, yes, I would I would certainly support the majority of the group so being the, so the lodge so owners. Money should get spent there. Yeah, it's here. In this well, building, on yeah. this building. So. No. All of us that's my contributed. Suggestion. That's my suggestion. Yes, we did. Two hundred thousand. So maybe one person from the community, but I agree, the majority yeah. should be lodge. But um, I think that's a great idea. Um, uh, would anyone on the board like to make a motion? We form a committee. I'll make the motion. We form a committee. Okay. A motion and a second to uh, have a committee to look into uh, investing. Approximately twenty-five thousand dollars in improvements to the lodge. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, same side. Okay. We're looking for volunteers. Uh, not just uh, let me know. Talk to me or talk to Joe or uh, any of the board members. Um, I think this is something that can be done this year. I don't see any reason not oh, yeah. to sit on this. The yeah. Let's project's get it spent done. And get it off the books. That's and uh, yeah. so. And even if you don't want to be on the committee, but you've got an idea, uh, email works. Drop us a line. Let us know what you're thinking. All right. Thank you. Let me double check here. I'm saying that uh, Jim made a motion seconded by Kathy to appoint a committee primarily consisting of lodge owners. Lodge owners. Mm -hmm. Have to make recommendations. Right. For improvements in the. The lodge and area, adjoining area, adjacent area, whatever you want to say. Quick question. One, I, I got the leftover uh, in the mail this week. Uh, I guess a required notification of this, the land swap that we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, how long does that process take? I mean, you said mentioned a year. But is it, <laughs> <laughs> it, well, uh, is it, there a required timeline that we are following? And because obviously the transfer is just a recordation of a deed. But well, it's turned out to be way more complicated than I thought, and 90% of the delay is on Glacier's side. They're not waiting for us. I mean, they waited maybe 10 days for our signatures because we weren't in town. Yeah. But it, and, I, and I don't think it's held up anything, um, but it's taken way longer than I understood, and our attorney's done 90% of it, to be honest. I just okay. sign when it comes to me. For those of you, as a way of background, when we did the agreement uh, to... Um, offer memberships, voluntary memberships to TACO um, through Glacier. A part of that major agreement was uh, one provision of it was a land swap. We have a couple of parking spaces that they were interested in having to support their offices, uh, which will be below the workout, the fitness center. In exchange, we got about a third of an acre, as I recall, on the hill uh, to the north. And that's just just moving along based on bureaucracy more than anything, or not moving along. But there's been no hitch. There's no reason why it won't get, it won't get resolved it's at some point. Right, yeah. The process. yeah. But anything you anything you do that involves a government entity, it takes more time. Yeah. 
and they're they're as frustrated as we are. It's it's been with the county. Um. Okay. Uh, one other item of new business. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. Relative to the parking places that we're swapping, and relative to the additional parking places that are facing south, that are being designated, they have some facing south and then some facing east. Those parking places are accessible only off of Taco property. Do we have an exist? No, it's not Taco property. It's, it's not Taco, taco easement, but it's not Taco property. We do not own the road. I understand we don't own the road that approaches up from Tamron Drive. But once you get to the top of that hill, our property line is at the, is at the back of those parking places. They will be accessing the parking places that face the south only off of Taco property. That's where the, that's where the easement. access easement comes in. Do yes. we have a cross easement agreement for them to access? Is it in place? That's in process. It's in process. It's oh, part, it's part of the land swap. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Part of, it's in process. Yeah. And likewise, we actually will come up across their property to get under the Etagere to get in and our building. We have been it's cross since easement. the building of the lodge. So your, your, your comment cross easement was absolutely correct. Yep. Okay. Um, one other item, and again, I'm going to turn this over to staff, but I make this uh, for everybody who's particularly the owners in the in the lodge. An owner has requested that we move the smoking area from the north patio on this end of the building where we have space and open air and cooking and smoking and, and move that to the east and say, and the reason they say that is because there's kids and there's food served on the north end and that's not a good area for smoking. Again, I'm not, I'm looking for feedback to the staff, not today. I just let you know that one owner thinks that's a good idea and uh, we're going to try and solicit some feedback from other people, particularly people who use that facility or live in the lodge. Where's the east patio? Right off this common area. Right. The, the new one they just built. Okay. Where the big sign that says no smoking today. Yeah, I, I, just, I guess I hadn't noticed. It. Yeah. It's not, but it, they, it, they can't, can they get through it from the outside? Or they have to come through the building? They have to come through the building. Okay, that's yeah. okay. And it's within 15 feet of an entrance, which is yeah. illegal. Mm, yeah, I don't I think any part of that patio the, is within 50. I, I'd have to get my tape measure, but you're, you're right. You're talking about so the central, central tower back there? That, that was the suggestion. Yeah. 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 Uh, that's a good I don't like yeah. the idea of the suggestion. I, I, I'm, I'm not, yeah. yeah. I'm just saying it, it's been raised by an owner. I'm not yeah. placing approval that's or disapproval. So, okay. Um, would you like to take a shot at the financial report, or should we break for lunch? Um, yeah, about you, you 15, 20 to... minutes, or I mean, I don't know. Take as long as you need, but I just I can start it now, and we can I mean, we can see how long it goes. And okay. Try to get it done before before we move on. So, okay. So, uh, so we're going to go ahead and do uh, the financial report, and then we'll take a break for lunch. So, uh, Gary, would you? Uh, I'm not going to be able to see this. Would you put the the PDF that I sent you of the financial reports up there? And then I'll just have to trust that you're paging through it at the same rate that I'm looking at my my hard copy. Are there? Oh, you know what? No, we. I told Sandy Elliott's going to be here for this, and I. Oh, okay. All right. I told her after lunch. Okay. Uh, so I'd like to hold on. We want to just get me head into a couple of these other ones now. Um. Yeah, but why don't we? Why don't we drop to? Those could be more complicated. You want to do? Why don't you do one, and Kathy can do the restaurant well, report. I need, I need Tony Heather here for this one. Okay. All right. So we have to wait on that. You want to talk a little bit about restaurant? Sure. Sure. So uh, with the the restaurant with the yellow carrot, and um, I am not I have not been a long owner of here in Tamron, only a couple of years, but was um, we had just purchased when the yellow carrot had opened. And there was a pre, there was a survey that had been sent out by Joe several years ago with regard to you know what were we looking for in a restaurant, etc. As we've been now open for well over a year, part of the discussion that we've had amongst the board and Gary and I have worked together is the the satisfaction that we had as owners with regard to the restaurants, and do we feel um, that we're we're happy with the services? So in discussion, um, we're contemplating sending another post-survey out to the owners to determine 
are the needs being met? You know, so with regard to quality of food, quality of the restaurant, the hours of operation, et cetera. So we're looking to have that survey and would love to hear feedback from you all if you feel like that would be something of interest. Um, the board did feel that um, we felt it would be a good thing to send out because again, you know, to get the, um, to me, everything is about communication. We can't make change if we don't have appropriate uh, communication. So with that, we would like to determine, you know, as you're here in the room, would you feel that a follow-up survey would be appropriate? And then communicating back to the owner of the other carrot. Yes, sir. Has uh, the lessee expressed any interest in receiving input? <laughs> no. <laughs> I would say you're wasting your time. Wasting our time. Well, I think, and I, 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 I hear you, and I understand and appreciate that. I just, you know, I, we have we no control over them. Right, but if we don't provide appropriate communication, is that is that effective either? So I look at it as if we can if we can provide that communication back to her, and she's not willing to change, then we've made we've noted what we felt, and she can do with what you know what she what she feels. But she has a contract as well. But I do feel like that we don't make a difference if we don't have effective communication is my thought. Yeah, I think part of the historical background, Ron, when Joe did the survey, when the board did the survey three, four years ago, the number one amenity on this property was the restaurant. And it was, I mean, it was very, very high. And at that point, we were, we were struggling. Okay, the world's changed. We actually now have two dining facilities on site. Um, and we think and we have probably 30% new ownership. So we, we're not sure where our, our constituency comes down on this issue. Um, so part of it is, yes, to give feedback to the owner of the yellow carrot. Part of it is to give feedback to the board as to how the ownership feels about this particular amenity. Um, and, and certainly, yeah, as, the, as the landlord, you know, we would like that tenant to be as successful as possible. So may I ask another direct question, but if Gary, Gary, you've been very involved from the get-go, including a plan for the board to, to handle the restaurant ourselves and so forth, and either you're happy or unhappy with the situation that we, we find ourselves in now, and you've worked diligently to create interest among homeowners in utilizing that facility, and I really personally thank you for that effort. I know it's not easy, but now we have a major competitor for the Yellow Carrot who, from appearances that of the emails that I receive is directly counter targeting every effort that you've attempted to make in creating interest at the yellow carrot um, do you see the yellow carrot long in the tooth for us I know no. they've got a five-year uh, lease but that's not the, at their option not at ours each of our other tenants has walked or if you're asking can the yellow carrot be successful with the mine shaft down there yes there's yes. only four tables and, down and, in the mine shaft, so we got to think about what it's going to be like in the golf season, right? Because it's not there's not that much room in there. And in the, but, in the but bar. at the same time, well, it's, it's all it is. That's all it is. It's a bar with some tables. Don't you have a big room? They don't no, serve. They food don't meetings. serve food only for only yeah, for meetings. Day. Yeah, okay. for meetings. So right. that's the main concern. I'm just so curious because they they appear to be based upon their emails very aggressive marketers, and I congratulate them for 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 attempting to do that, creating reasons to go there. But as, as somebody who has faced competition my entire working career, that doesn't make things easier. Um, and I just don't know if our lessee is upping her game to compete. And you've answered the question, and I thank you. Well, the, the, there are some changes that we've talked about that we think would help if she, if she were to make them. And then I've said this at virtually every meeting that we've had discussing the restaurant, the ultimate success or failure is going to be up to all of us. That's what it's going to be up to. Um, and yes, she has it in her hands to uh, make some changes and, and that I think the ownership here would like to see, but in the end, it's all going to be up to us. Particularly because there's no road signage for yellow carrot and no road signage for us anymore. And she, those signs, the Todd signs should be up, I think she said, in about three weeks. The Department of Transportation sign? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Yes, ma'am. Ms. Diane. Um, I live here full time. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Diane, eight two six pine Um, I think when we first started this restaurant venture, there was talk that she'd be open at lunch, that all these things were going to happen. What I have seen is it narrowing services, uh, inconsistent food, and not listening to what people would like to have on the menu. That's all part of trying to compete with the mind shift. I personally use the mind shaft because I like the food better. I think that's the reason for the survey. That I mean, is the greatest issue with that restaurant. Right. Yeah. And thank you, Diane, for that. Um, absolutely. And I think that's where it becomes very effective to get. You know, because you can say something, I can say something, Michelle. We can all say something, but if we have larger numbers, then it's more effective to go back to her to say, here is the consensus. Yeah. You know, we had the result of X amount of owners. Um, this is what the expectation or this is what we're looking for. Yeah. Also, you can use it. But my other question is, she is opening a new restaurant in town. She has new management here. I've seen it work or not work. I kind of feel like we're getting the short end of the stick. All those promises, oh, we'll, we'll have dinner and then we'll open for lunch. The only place you can get lunch or anything before 5 or 5.30 is the lunch. Diane, I think for the record, that's exactly the way we all feel. And that's why we want to do the survey. That's why we want to reach out. She wasn't open spring break. Yeah. You know, we had all these people here spring break, and she didn't open until Wednesday, which half the week was over at that point because, you know, a lot of people came in the Saturday before, the Friday before. Um, she needs to hear it, but she doesn't need to hear it just from the board. We want to get owners uh, indication of what their preferences are. I mean, we allowed her to pick Wednesday to Sunday, I think. I don't know if we allowed her, if that was her suggestion. Um, I don't know that that was the right choice, but I think we need to get the owners to chime in. And, and she's got to serve. I mean, this we're her primary customers. She okay. sold a bill of goods and said she had all these North County customers and she was going to get them all in here. Well, I don't see a lot of outsiders coming in. So. Well, and going to Gary's comment about it's up to all of us, I tried to support that restaurant. But the food and the inconsistency is my main problem. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why a survey would be good. I think the other aspect about a survey is you will certainly garner some complaints, but hopefully it'll also garner some opportunities for improvement. And 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 that's what we're really trying to do is is not to send a message that she's doing poorly, but that there's an opportunity for even more business if she's willing to work on these particular areas. And we want a broad based reflection of what those areas should be. And, and Diane, I don't want anybody to misconstrue my statement about it being up to us. I don't expect anybody to go in there if they're not happy with either the food, the service, the price, whatever. The, the best way that you, that you exercise your opinion is by not spending your money somewhere. I mean, that's, that, that, that's the way that, that, that you exercise at the best. And if, if she's not going to make certain changes that, yeah. that, you know, Kathy and I suggest to her and that, that we get from, from uh, the ownership, so be it. I mean. Well, let me ask you this. So be it. Does that mean you're locked in by your Does she have all the power? Or can we say, well, you're not serving us. We're never locked into anything, but I mean, I think to the point, she's open in a restaurant downtown. We don't know what that means. I mean, is that going to hurt us? Probably. Um, I mean, she's never here already, as from what I can see. I mean, you can tell me better than me. But. Or, or from a positive perspective, maybe it makes her better at running a, a restaurant business and she sees 
to where she can see success, success on both sides. So again, you don't know. We don't know what we don't know until we ask the questions. I always say, don't ask, don't get. So if we don't provide the feedback, we don't get anywhere. Um, all it can, it, it can't pause it, it can't hurt us, obviously. It can only help us, is the way I look at it. And we do have an opportunity to keep in mind that there's only four tables downstairs or down at the, 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 the mine shaft. So if we start getting a lot of traffic up here, she really could see an incremental pickup in business, but we need to understand what those hours need to look like. I mean, maybe she should be open for lunch. We got a bunch of golfers here, come, you know, finishing a morning round or coming in before they go off. She may see a good opportunity, but right now she's not even open. Yeah. And, and as far as the specific, the fact that she's, I don't know whether she's moving across the street or just expanding, but she's already a multi-site uh, operator. She already service at, at Mercury Building. She already has a catering business. So I think one more site in and of itself doesn't cause me any great consternation. She's demonstrated that she can manage multiple sites for the last 10 years or so that she's been in Durango. Uh, I don't think we should be concerned specifically about the fact that she's either moving across the street or opening a new business. What we need to do is get her attention so that she focuses a little more on providing service to the needs of this community. Okay, well, you have a question? Uh, well, I just wanted to point out that since it's the restaurants are an amenity to Tampa, uh, it's important that we have the best restaurants to serve us and anybody else that, that comes to a resort to to enjoy themselves. Um, I am absolutely in favor of the survey, uh, and just as a uh, aside, it seems to me that. Nobody's serving breakfast, and breakfast isn't a big money maker, but it brings people in, and you don't have to have a lot of um, labor uh, to, to handle a breakfast grab. And it, it can become a very uh, profitable uh, addition to a place that has units for rent nightly. So I'm definitely in favor of, of having the best that we can get uh, to service. Yeah, I think we're in agreement. Let me just comment. Breakfast is highly profitable day part. And not a break-even kind of thing. It's highly profitable. Um, to add to what this gentleman said, you know, we are a hotel kind of operation and we have a lot of visitors and tourists and her menu is rather exotic and I often think if I had three kids coming in here who wanted hamburgers you know it's not being provided and I feel that the restaurant at Tamron should cater in part to these visitors I think you nailed it. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, hamburgers we and fries, we, we, may, we old people may not be eating those, but the young <laughs> kids are eating that. <laughs> we probably shouldn't be eating those, but we are. <laughs> and, and hence the reason for the service. <laughs> Take our cue from the president and his diet. But, um, <laughs> and, and yes, ma'am, and, anyway. and thank you for saying that, because we have talked about that. You know, obviously, I don't have a young child any longer, but that is, you know, what people are looking for. And I have been in the Yellow Carrot when I have seen a group of kids, and you've got the kid with his head on the table. Yeah, they read the menu and yeah. go, what? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so that is part of the survey. So when we send the survey out, we would certainly appreciate the feedback. Um, and constructive feedback. You know, we, we all know what we know already, but we really are looking for constructive feedback and honesty as to what can we take forward to make this a better um, experience for I all of us. I think breakfast is a great it's idea fun. during tourist season. I think the mind shift and yeah. breakfast burritos or had heard that at one point in time. Yeah, Ken, is the, is the mind shift serving breakfast? It's grab and go right now. Grab and go? One of the things that we have talked about, and I suggested this to Sari a long time before she even opened, is, is to have one person come up with breakfast burritos, bring up 20, 30, 40, I, whatever it takes, 20, 30, 40 um, pre-made breakfast burritos or 
you know, breakfast sandwiches and serve, serve coffee, coffee and juice. One person, you section off part of the part of the restaurant, and it would be it wouldn't be very labor intensive. It's already made down there. That suggestion hasn't gone very far yet, and that's something that I think will probably be something to that effect will be in the survey, and Kathy and I will talk with her about that at some point after we get the results of the survey. Before we had this restaurant and the other one, uh, we had a nice deli in that room. <clears throat> and people could order something like a burrito or something to go if they were on the run on the road. And I thought that was very successful for this kind of a hotel. You know. It wasn't. Mm -hmm. It wasn't. Uh, DM, wasn't. DMR, wasn't Ken, market. when you were working for DMR, they were running that deli, and it right. it never made money. Well, that was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and, yeah. hey, it was a great I was a great place to eat, but I, I'm afraid it was not a financial success. Uh, and, of course, that was coming out of somebody else's pocket, so it was good for taco. <laughs> I'm not saying it was ever – I'm not saying it was run – I mean, there were limitations on what you could do in there. Yeah. It just didn't go. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think think you've got some some feedback. I think just the fact that we've burned through 15 or 20 minutes tells you it's still an interest an item of interest and and one we can, and we can potentially improve on for the overall enjoyment of our community. Uh, I'm thrilled to have two restaurants, and I wish they were wish them both success. Um, no question about it. When do you expect to? have the survey drafted? We have questions already um, drafted. We did get feedback amongst the board, so we'll just be refining that and get with you. Mm -hmm. We have our Survey Monkey subscription, and it works really well. It does. Thank you all. With that, I think the board will uh, will take uh, a break for an executive session, uh, but we will reconvene uh, as best we can promptly at 1 o'clock. Uh, we've got some reports to get through this afternoon. These are all good things, and we'll see you in about 55 minutes. Yeah, we're, yeah. Now the mics are open. Thank you. Um, we are returning from executive session. Uh, no decisions were taken. Thank you. No actions were taken. Um, Gary, how many do we have online at this point? Is it still the same group, more or less? Two, three, four, five. There are five online right now. Five lines open anyway. Okay, thank you. Sounds like we're about in the same place. Yep. Okay. No new, no newcomers. All right, thank you. Um, so this afternoon we're going to uh, <coughs> move through some reports uh, on activities, committees working uh, here on the board. We're going to start with uh, an update the interest for everybody, our financial condition. Uh, and I'll turn the floor over to Joe Carey. Okay, uh, and we have with us uh, Sandy Elliott, our, our accountant. Sandy's been our CPA accountant for how many years? A lot of years. A lot of years. <laughs> <laughs> lots and lots. Ever since you, uh, ever since you separated yourself from Frederick Zink and, and really, Elliott. And really, before then, I was the person behind you. You were the one doing it. Yeah. Okay. 
So, and, uh, and I know many of you have communicated with Elisa Olager downtown at the accounting office, and Elisa is Sandy's daughter, so in case you didn't know that. Um, and she does a good job for us, too. So <clears throat> I'll go through the financial reports, and, and if I have to lean on Sandy for any uh, stuff that, a, that a, only an accountant knows, I'll, uh, I'll do that. <clears throat> <laughs> so starting with uh, uh, the second page of the of the reports that you were handed out, uh, the not the cover letter, the the, the balance sheet. Um, I'm not going to go through every line item, but I'll point out some things about certain line items, and then if there's questions uh, <clears throat> afterward, I'll uh, I'll entertain questions, or we'll entertain questions. Um, the first item that I'd like to point out is uh, account 101.3, which is residual dollars that remain from prior year's uh, activities with the rental program. Um, you'll see when I show you the rental program budget that we've decided to take this money and spread it over three years, divide it up equally by three, and apply it to uh, each of the next three years, including 2018. Uh, to offset costs for those uh, for those years, um, so that's what that is. Um, account 102 is our is the capital account that supports uh, another page in the, uh, in the in the financial statements that I'll be going over uh, with this report, and that's our our uh, our capital money that we spend on a year over year basis. This isn't reserves. It's money that is earmarked to be spent this year. Um, and we are currently contributing, a, a per the budget, $43,313 a month into that account. <clears throat> uh, account 103 is uh, our permanent reserves that reside in the Bank of the San Juans right here in Durango. Um, and I'll be talking about how we're allocating our reserves and how that balance will be changing soon uh, when I give a report on reserves directly following this, uh, this financial report. Uh, let's see, account 106, uh, I referred to this earlier in new business. This is the uh, account, uh, the special assessment account, the leftover money that uh, was for the lodge remodel. Uh, as I indicated, there was about $16,000 in there, uh, plus another 9,000 that uh, should go to that account when the, the one owner who hasn't paid his uh, special assessments in full yet uh, gets those paid. <clears throat> and then the last line in that group, 107, uh, is the money that is currently deposited in a chain of certificates of deposit uh, that was put together by Jerry Q2 last year. Uh, there's currently 202,209.79 in that uh, in that account, and I'll explain when I do the reserves report uh, how that money is split up and how we've uh, uh, taken advantage of the interest rates and the and the safety factors with CDs to uh, maximize our returns while uh, giving us some uh, principal safety. Uh, the only other item on the balance sheet that I want to mention is down uh, towards the bottom, account 240 under current liabilities, deferred revenue. This is actually the uh, May and June, the second and third months of the second quarter of owner's assessments um, that are they're, they're mostly paid, but they're not, uh, we don't show them on the uh, we don't show them as uh, as assets until those months actually roll through, right? Have I got, have I got yeah, that right? Yeah, my terminology is we can't recognize May and June income until May and June comes along. That's why you're an accountant and I'm not. I know. Yeah. I'm trying not to talk accountants, but. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So that's all I have to say on the balance sheet. Uh, flipping to the next page, uh, the first page of the uh, of our income statement. <clears throat> So the first thing I want to point out on this one is the absence, if you look at the budget that's posted online, 
there's three line items at the top of this, uh, at the top of the income uh, grouping uh, for money that we have, that was a carryover from, from prior years uh, for uh, one for the operating budget, one for the capital budget, and one for money that we're going to do, we are actually going to draw from reserves this year to support our capital projects, which include the uh, the, the elevator uh, retrofit in the central tower. And um, because accountants don't like to see money that you made in one year claimed as income or claimed on a on a report in yeah. again. Can't get you can't make money twice, right? I, you could try. Okay. And we've come People up and I, jail when that happens. and I and I talked to Sandy and I talked to Tommy Meadows downtown, who's Sandy's partner, and we came up with a way to fix that, and it's at the it's on the next page, and I'll get and I'll show you that when we get there. But it, it, it makes our balance without having that somewhere referenced here. It makes our bu our budget look unbalanced, and it's not. Okay, so uh, account 404, I want to mention something there. Um, that's uh, uh, maintenance revenue. Uh, that is actually actuals through March because the 27,000 of revenues for April is not showing on this, uh, on this uh, uh, report. So that would, bring, uh, that would bring that account almost, almost even. Um, and a little bit short because we tend not to have as much maintenance activity on units and on the property during the winter, and that'll catch up uh, over the summer. More people are here in the summer, and, and so there's more maintenance calls. Uh, count 408 is uh, storage unit rental. Um, the reason that one looks low is because the first quarter is actually billed in December and isn't reflected there. And at the end of the year, the first quarter of, uh, of 2019 will actually be allocated to uh, 2018, and it'll balance that budget out over the full 12 months. So that's why that looks a little short. It actually isn't. It's all about delays and deferred, uh, deferred accounting. Uh, mailbox assessments, uh, count 424. Um, Dave talked about this in his uh, uh, property report. The only area that is left to finish uh, is Gamble Oak. And so another about $6,500 will be assessed to the Gamble Oak owners who don't have mailboxes uh, when those are put in. And then that'll finish out that, uh, that line item. It'll come, in a little, it'll come in a bit under budget. Uh, let's see, um, interest income. Uh, this interest income is only the interest that we get on our Bank of the San Juans account. And you can see it's pretty small. I'm still trying to figure out why, why we budgeted $1,200 there because we're, we're never going to get there. Yeah. <laughs> so as you can see, you know, when you have money in a money market account at a bank, it gets virtually nothing. And that's why we're moving a lot of our reserves into the CD chain so we can take advantage of higher, some higher returns. Um, administrative expenses. Joe, just as an aside, if we do redeem one or more of those CDs in the fall and use the proceeds against the elevator project, then we will see an actualization of that interest income and it would show up on this line. Is that right? Well, we likely wouldn't redeem one of those CDs. We'd likely, we'd likely withdraw the money from the bank of the San Juan's account, where it's not making any money anyway. Oh, well, if we don't, if we wait until then to do that, I, yeah, I know you're going to move some of it before then. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think there's a new, um, a new statement here called permanent reserve, and that's where the actual yeah, I was going to talk interest to is, that, going, yeah. is reflected. So I think that's the answer to your question. Okay, so it shows up as an increase in that account rather yes. than as in right. interest income. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I was going to get to that. Yeah, you mentioned it. Okay, um, administrative expenses. Um, 
everything there looks uh, looks pretty good. It's pretty close to on budget. Uh, the legal fees, again, like the maintenance revenue, doesn't really show the uh, uh, the April billing because it uh, it wasn't it wasn't billed until May because we don't receive our our bill from uh, from our attorney's office until the first of the following month. So that figure would be a lot would be much closer and probably a thousand or two above the year-to-date budget. Other than that, everything else looks pretty good there. Um, operations, the 600 accounts, um, building maintenance, uh, we're a little bit high there. And the reason for that is we had two major incidents <clears throat> in, the, uh, in the lodge of, uh, over the winter of uh, flood damage. Uh, the first one was a unit flood that was above the restaurant, and there were, Kent, Dave's not here, so I, Gary, do you remember what unit it was that uh, caused that it one? It was uh, 203. 203. 203. 203. Yeah. So, the, so the flood was in 203. It cascaded down to the first floor and then down to the restaurant. So the damage in, uh, in the restaurant uh, was, uh, was paid for by Taco. We didn't... Um, uh, we didn't we didn't make a claim on our insurance company because it wasn't over our 10,000 deductible um, so we uh, we absorbed that but the bigger one was uh, in February uh, some of the, one of the glacier con contractors uh, working in the area right around where the if you've been up there where the old fitness area was and the lobby desk in the uh, in the fitness area um, where Diane used to work, uh, there was just above that, just above that desk area, there was some sprinkler pipes that burst. And the reason for it was because some glacier contractors removed the insulating blankets that were protecting that area to do some work in there and didn't put them up at the end of the shift. And we had a real heavy freeze that night. And uh, the next morning, a Saturday morning, we had a flood. And the remediation work on that has been complete. It cost about ten thousand dollars, and Glacier has been billed for that, and so that will offset that and bring it pretty close to budget when that bill when that bill's paid. Um, the other thing I've mentioned on uh, in the operations budget is you see a lot of zeros in the year to date uh, in the year to date actuals column, the first column. Uh, and some low numbers, and that's because we tend to do a lot of these these projects, these items uh, in the sp in the spring, summer, and early fall. So those will all fill in over the next several months. Next page. Uh, count eight, uh, 684 depreciation expense. Uh, we had this on on the budget again this year. I don't think we had it in previous years. We may have flipped back and forth at some point. Jerry, you asked about this at the last board meeting, I believe. Didn't you? Yeah. Somebody uh, did. I did. Yes, you did. Yeah. Yeah. And I asked Sandy to explain it. And as usual, it's got a nice accountant's explanation. So I'm going to let her tell you why it's there. OK, I'm going to give you a crash course in gap accounting, generally accepted accounting principles. When you make a large, when any business makes a large purchase, you're not allowed to, and it has a lifetime over a number of years, you're not allowed to expense that. You have to put it on the balance sheet, and then each year you take a portion of that and, and expense it, and it's called depreciation expense at that point. Um, in your case, the items being depreciated are on the balance sheet under fixed assets, um, some of the units, equipment, restaurant remodel, and then you'll see accumulated depreciation. That's how much has been expensed um, over the years of those fixed assets. Um, in prior years, we weren't doing this monthly. It always showed up on the on the annual. The statement. year end, yeah, right? Yeah. But it never was monthly. One of you guys, I don't know if it was Eric, it might have been you, Eric. I'll blame you. you wanted to see it monthly. 
And that's proper. It's how it should be. But because so many people don't understand appreciation, we just left it off for interim statements and didn't put it in until the end of the year. Is that, works that for, right? Works for me. Okay. Uh, personnel expenses, uh, account 601 salaries, a little under. Uh, main reason for this is we still have an open slot in the uh, in the maintenance shop for a, for an IT tech, and we haven't filled that yet. Um, Dave says we will be filling it, uh, just hasn't found the right person yet. Uh, so we're kind of filling in the blanks on our own, and Gary's doing some of that stuff. <laughs> anyway. Poorly, um, I might have. Huh? Yeah. Um, under utilities, a um, couple things. You notice that um, under accounts uh, 701 and 720, we have a reim we have reimbursements for 701.1 uh, and 720.1 for the yellow carrot reimbursements. That's their payments for their share of water and sewer and electricity. And right now, that's showing only one month's January uh, payments. So the yellow carrot hasn't paid their water and sewer and electricity for February, March, and April. And the reason for that is that there was a misunderstanding between them and us. They had petitioned the board, uh, I guess, so to make their, their business uh, profit and loss look a little better. Uh, to have us pay for their, comp them the electricity and the water and sewer. Um, I think, I don't know whether we ever officially declined that request, uh, but, um, and they thought that it had never been resolved or answered, and they were waiting to see when it was gonna be answered to pay the bills. We, I talked to Gary about this yesterday, and he talked to Patty Barker, who is uh, Sari's accountant and the message I gave was they need to pay the bills and um, and I also sent the message that I didn't think we'd be approving the board would be approving uh, that further uh, request on their port because we're already giving them free rent free free equipment maintenance and uh, there was one other item that's escaping me now but they, Heat AC. Yes, it, that's AC. it. The heating and air conditioning. The only thing their electricity covers is the is the uh, the cooking equipment, the lights, and you know plug-ins. Um, the heating and air conditioning is part of our central unit, and so they get that free as well. So uh, the message has been sent: pay the bills. Uh, so we await that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the other things that look out of line are the cable TV and the internet. And the reason for that, and the reason they, they are over budget, is because when we budgeted in October, when we still were under the assumption that our contract with Groove Entertainment was going to be implemented sometime this year, uh, we, were, we were looking forward to much lower cost per unit for cable TV and well, satellite TV and, uh, and internet service. But that hasn't happened yet. And, uh, and so if this situation continues, which it might, uh, the, the, these, uh, these two accounts are gonna be severely over budget by the end of the year. And we'll talk about that at a later reports in the in the meeting, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So coming back to the top of uh, the first page of the uh, of the income statement, where I said those those three items on the income side weren't there, you'll see this memorandum only uh, notation at the bottom, which on the uh, on all three columns it applies the amounts. Uh, both the budget, the year-to-date budget, and the year-to-date allocations 
for January through April. And then that would get us to a balanced budget and then also shows us that year to date uh, our expenditures are favorable uh, to the tune of $27,717. So there's the operating accounts. And if we go to the capital account, um, the income side looks fine. Uh, no issues there. Um, this is an allocation of the assessment fees to the uh, to the capital to the capital budget on a monthly basis, so that it's funded properly throughout the year. Um, the only items that I would uh, point out are the mailboxes. 802 is that'll fill in when uh, when the Gamble Oak mailboxes are completed. And that should happen. Do we have a schedule on that, Gary? Did Dave say anything? Not yet. Yeah. It, it would depend upon what people want, that email that I sent out about oh, yes. the shelter. You got, is that already sent out? Yeah. Oh, okay. It, just that email was sent out. We haven't done a questionnaire. It's, it's not going to happen. Okay. Um, so anyway, you, again, you see a lot of zeros like you did on the uh, operating side maintenance uh, for projects that will be completed in the summer and the early fall. So those numbers will all fill in. All fill in. 844, the parking lot resurface at Gamble Oak. Uh, we paid half down on that, and they've done the crack ceiling, as Dave said, and they'll finish the job in the fall. And uh, just for the record, Joe, I would know that Chris, I don't see either Chris or Alan, but we do have $12,000 budgeted for bat mitigation. So there we go. We, we planned on it, um, yeah. and I'll make sure that they get that message. Yeah. And then the bottom line on the capital budget uh, is that it looks like we're, we're in a big favorable position, but that's, again, that's because we've got deferred work that hasn't been started yet, and it'll all fill in during the summer and the fall. Um, then the next page, as Sandy mentioned, this is kind of a new sheet in our uh, in our financial statements, and this gives you a picture of of how we're allocating money from our uh, from our capital accounts to the to the permanent reserve, and then also where our interest income is uh, is coming from uh, that goes that gets folded right into our permanent reserves. So there's the answer to your question, Eric, which year-to-date we've got uh, $1,185.51 in interest on that CD chain that uh, we have at uh, First Internet Bank. In, in First Internet Bank, yeah. And we budgeted. So, yeah, we just we just didn't understand where to budget it. We, yeah. we, we put in in the right, uh, I guess, at what the income would be. We just didn't put it in the right account. Well, that's going to be more than that by year end, much more than that by year end. Yeah, interest rates have come up a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> since October. Yeah. Well, actually, the, well, I'll talk about that in the in the, uh, in the reserves funding portion of this. Uh, the unexpected revenue there of two thousand dollars. This was the sale of some of the old fitness equipment that we had in the uh, uh, in the old workout room that we removed that belonged to us, and we removed it before we turned that property over to Glacier. So we got picked up a couple thousand dollars on that. Uh, the last page on the income statements is the rental program. And this looks a lot different on the income side than it did last year um, because we changed the whole paradigm on how the front desk gets budgeted and how it gets funded. Uh, again, the carryover beginning balance. Of 14,000 is not shown above in the income side. It's showed as a memorandum at the bottom. Uh, so we have now four lines of, of income on, on the uh, for the rental program. First is the contribution, a straight contribution from the general fund, and you can see that's an even amount uh, allocated on a monthly basis. 
Uh, 460 is the admin fees. Now this is what used to be the $20 a night, and then we, we also added the $5 uh, contribution for the pool and fitness. But for the, for the rental program purposes, it was $20 per night on any short-term rental. We reduced that to $8 per night um, in light of the fact that now there's a contribution from the general fund and also account 473 at the bottom, all rental units now contribute a flat fee of $30 a month towards the, towards the uh, funding for the front desk. And then long-term rentals account 472 uh, allocate, they, they pay $45 a month for, uh, for funding for the front desk. So, so less money is now being uh, extracted from rental unit owners and more from the general fund to, to fund the front desk. And if we play this the way it should be played, and we'll see in, in, but in subsequent budget years, that number, that ratio could continue to go uh, in favor of the rental program. But we'll see how the, how the board uh, acts on that. Uh, because the uh, resort fees that are going to be extracted from rental program owners for, uh, from their rentals by the Valley Fitness Facility will go up. It's, it's at a fixed amount this year. I think it's $17 a month. $18 a month? Yeah. I so 17, 17, 17, 17, 17. It goes up to 20 next year, and yeah. then it goes to 25 the following year. Caps out at 25. <clears throat> so that's how we're funding the front desk now, uh, and funding this, uh, this, this budget. Um, marketing is over budget, but that's because Heather front loads all the marketing activities, gets into all the magazines, and so forth, and I think you. I think Scott's going to talk a little bit about uh, the the newer marketing program the, in another report later on. Uh, ski shuttle way under budget. Well, no no doubt about why that was the case. We had no snow this year, so not many people were skiing. Or as Heather said, said the roads were good, so if they were going up to ski, they were using their own cars because it wasn't a big deal to drive. Um, and coffee service is down, but Heather usually buys this stuff in bulk, and she just hasn't made a bulk buy this year yet. She's probably still running off inventory that she had left over from last year, so she'll be that'll even out. Joe, can I revisit line 460? It looks like we're yeah 80, way ahead. Is that because of better business? Better business. Good. Way more rentals than we had anticipated. This budget. This this budget should look really good by year end. Yeah. I I was telling Scott, and I, I don't know if any of you have seen it yet, but the there's a the Tamaran uh, website, and you're probably going to talk about it. It's new. It just it just went up a couple of days ago. Heather's website. Heather's, Heather's website. website. Not not your web. Not our website. The Tamaran Vacation Rentals website. It's brand new. Completely different look. And I just, curiosity, I just went and looked at it, and I checked on, I looked at my unit to see what my rentals looked like. I couldn't believe how many rentals I've got reserved already this year. So it's, it's going to be a really good year. Exactly. Yeah. Um, the bottom line is the rental program is running a, ahead of budget, and it's largely because of that uh, increased rentals and the increased admin fees. So that's the financial report. Any questions from the board? Um, and maybe you'll talk about this. The fact that we're ahead, and it's too early, obviously, that's only the first four months, but does some of that reflect the, the opportunity to play golf over the summer? Is that helping the rental program? Could we document I think that golf, yet? and I think knowing that the, the fitness facility is going to be there. I mean, that's future reservations. That's not year to date. But right. That's, that's got to be affecting future reservations. Yeah, I mean, and we've been doing some additional marketing, too, which I'll cover, which, again, yeah. it's really hard to correlate that with an actual rental. But. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> okay. Okay. Uh, so then I will, Gary, if you want to put up that, uh, that reserves report. And the first thing I have to say on this is thanks, Jerry, because this may this may look a lot like his report from 
a previous meeting, uh, and that's because I took his and I edited it because I'm not real good with PowerPoint, and I learned a few things here, so this is good. Anyway, so uh, let's go to the first. Yeah. All right. So as Jerry reported in his, um, well, no, wait a minute. Uh, as as of April uh, 30th of this year, uh, we currently have. $703,906 in permanent reserves. Uh, you saw the breakout of that on the on the balance sheet. Uh, about 501,696 is in the uh, uh, in the uh, Bank of the San Juans account, and about 202,000 is in the uh, First Internet Bank of Indiana uh, CDs chain. Um, our documents require us to keep this at 250. Yeah, the 500000 in the Bank of the San Juans is way over that, and we're going to be doing something about that uh, real soon. Um, and our government, governing docu documents authorize investments of reserve funds, which we're doing. Next page, Gary. So as Jerry uh, reported at the last meeting or previous meeting, uh, the reserves investment study was conducted in uh, last year. CDs were, were selected as the investment vehicle, and uh, there was some criteria, uh, at least four-star rating by bank rate or power, and, uh, and good rates of return. Next slide, Jer uh, Gary. So this is what, uh, this slide is what Jerry uh, reported on, showed that the Bank of Indiana, the First Internet Bank of Indiana was selected. We invested $200,000 in um, eight $25,000 CDs in six, 12, and 18 month, uh, six, 12, 18, and 24 month uh, instruments, 25,000 each. And the interest rates are shown right there. So remember that when you see this next slide, because two of the six, two of the, two of the six month CDs, the two six month CDs, have now been converted to 24-month CDs. This was upon their maturity in 2018, or February 2018. And now we currently have two CDs, two 12 months at 50,000 and change, two 18-month CDs at 50,000 and change, and four 24-month CDs at 101,000 and change. Now the thing to remember about this key thing is that these all have staggered um, maturity dates. So once, once these CDs all will eventually become 24-month CDs with maturity dates every six months. So that'll give us liquidity plus give us the highest rate of return. And if you look, if you remember what the rates of return were on the previous slide, you see that they've now bumped up some because the lowest rate has now been replaced by the highest rate at the other end. I'll go back and flip back there, Gary, real quick. So we had we had 1.32% up to 1.81, and now go back to the fifth slide, Gary. We had, we now have 1.57% up to 1.82. So we're making more money on that money now than we did during the first six months of the, of the program. So what do we do next? Well, we add a second similar batch of CDs at $200,000. Uh, I've identified, done some research and identified some banks. And as you can see, the rates are significantly up from where they were uh, a year ago, almost a year ago. Um, I've, I've, Looking at Ally Bank, Synchrony Bank, Kansas State Bank, there's others. These all have five-star ratings. Uh, we can probably use four-star ratings and get a little bit better rate, uh, but it's going to be in the in the low to mid two percent range for the 12-month CDs. The six-month and the 18-month uh, will be slightly less, and the 24-month will be slightly higher. But the main thing is we'll be getting more money on this next chain. And what we're going to do is we're going to set this set this chain up so that it starts three months offset from from the uh, from the original one, so that once all the CDs have rolled over into 24s, 
then our liquidity increases even more because now we don't have CDs maturing every six months, we have them maturing every three months, but at different institutions. And based on the amount of money we have in the bank right now, in the reserves in the Bank of San Juans, we should probably do this one more time and have three sets of 200,000 with $100,000 left in, in the Bank of the San Juans, which would then have us uh, allow us plenty of time before any of them hit the 250 FDIC maximum. So that's the goal. And I'll be looking to communicate with the board in the next few weeks and get that second chain uh, <clears throat> set in stone, deposited, moved. Any questions on any of that? Just my thanks. Yeah. It's a long time coming, but thanks, in thanks, Jerry. He did all the foot, the, gr the grunt work. I'm doing the easy part because now I, I was on Jerry's committee. I'm just glad <laughs> to see it continue to carry on. It, I mean, yeah. and he set up a program. It's the now now do the subsequent ones is pretty easy actually. For how many years, Jerry? We was a quarter of a percent. I mean, we we couldn't earn any money even if we invested it. But no. the world has changed, and we're we're responding to that. And that's great. Hey, Joe. Yeah, I have a quick question. I get these those questionnaires from lenders all the time, mm -hmm. and we've made up our own form that you know, I yeah. fill out and I try to update that. Right. Is the 700 and what is it? 700 701, 701, 701, 702, 702, something like that. Yeah. Is that the number that I can put on that form for our reserve account? Yes. That so okay. that total. Yeah. That total. It's right now in two institutions. It'll ultimately be in four. Okay. Just to keep it. To keep the to keep it uh, all in compliance with uh, or under the FDIC limit, so we don't you know so we don't have too much money. In one and it and it will unfortunately go up and down. When we pay for the elevators, for example, it's going right. to take a, a step down. Right. <clears throat> That's why it's there. Well, they always ask about the operating budget too, and that goes up and down even more. That's it. Okay. Any questions from the board? Any questions from the audience or online? All right. The next speaker is talking about our water and sewer situation. Oh, this this Jerry Kijo? Yeah. Jerry, do you want to slides? I'd offer you my seat, but you can hardly see from here. <laughs> Grab one of them. It's okay. Yep. I'll just stand up. I'll just stand up. Actually shout at everybody. Uh, okay, uh, so this will be a, a brief update on what's been happening with uh, water and sewer situation. Uh, for those of you who have not been following uh, the board meetings over the last several years, um, this situation has been kind of a, a bit of an open wound in that our previous rate agreement with Glacier for providing water and sewage uh, services to us that rate agreement expired in 2013, and, and there were provisions in our in our agreements to negotiate a new contract to replace uh, that rate structure that, that was in, in prior effect. However, that has not happened. In fact, even though we've been beating on this for four years now since I've been involved in it, uh, I would say that the progress has been at a glacier's pace. <laughs> that glacier would be good to glacier. Okay, uh, but there are things that are happening now, and so I, I think it's important that you understand that there is beginning to be some movement on it, and so I'll, I'll cover some of that uh, today. Uh, next, next slide, Gary. Okay. Um, Water and sewer fees that, that TACO pays are significant. They're 50, about 15% of our, our total annual budget. For example, this year, what we pay for uh, water and sewer is for over $416,000 um, out of our uh, total uh, budget of uh, uh, $2.7 million. Uh, so it's, it's quite significant. It means that every homeowner here is paying in excess of $1,000 a year uh, for water and sewer, so it's very significant. Um, we have been seeing 3% increases going back to about 20, 2005, shortly after the 10-year uh, agreement was put in place in 2003. 
Uh, there have been a couple of years where we've had a little bit of abatement um, of that 3% increase, but even though the rates expired in 2013, Glacier has continued to raise the rates by about 3% every year with a couple of, of exceptions. So it's continued to go up and up and up. One thing that we did was we tried to get data on what our consumption here at TACO is because we had historic information that Joe and, and I think uh, John may have gotten from Glacier about the total amount of domestic water produced by the Glacier um, water plant. That figure in terms of gallons has been running about 50 million gallons produced per year for quite some time. It's been relatively uh, constant, maybe gone up a little bit, but not much. We, in fact, uh, they've done uh, and maintenance got us a bunch of meters to install on, on our lines that didn't quite work out. But Glacier, as, as their first um, effort to install meters on all of the water lines, installed them at Taco Properties first. There is now a meter on each of the buildings um, on property. As, and historically, we've had them in, in the lodge that, uh, that Glacier has used. Looking at the data from those meters, we found that our consumption for a 12-month period was a little over 10% of the total produced. Um, and if we include the irrigation, which uh, Glacier began charging us for uh, in 2017, I believe, um, that figure is still under 15% consumption. We didn't have data, although we had asked Glacier for it, for how much uh, how much money they had been collecting, what their expenses were for producing, et cetera, et cetera. And even though they had been promised to us some years ago, uh, back when John and I were working on this, uh, that that information was not forthcoming until now. So uh, that's a little bit of background. Uh, next slide, Gary. Importantly, uh, there was a meeting that was held be between uh, members of the TACO board and members of Glacier uh, Management and Ownership. And as a result of that meeting, uh, we actually received in February a copy of a preliminary limited distribution rate study report from the company in Denver, BBC, who has been doing the analysis for Glacier Club to set new rates for all of its water and sewer customers. That report contains information about Glacier's historical costs and revenues to operate the water and sewage plants. And again, that's something that we've been asking for and had been promised years ago, but finally was, was given to us. That said, at the very beginning of that report was a caveat that said that these numbers cannot be used to make any plans or whatever. They're subject to change. They're preliminary. So um, that was a caveat that we had. We have a, what I would call now a, a very core group that has been working on this, and I think it's a, a, good, a good group. It includes uh, our president, um, Eric Divitz, Joe Car Carey, um, treasurer, who has been historically involved in all aspects of this stuff for many years. Um, our uh, council, General Go Je Ken Golden, uh, and we have on board a water engineer in Durango, uh, Steve Harris, uh, who has his own engineering company down there, and myself. So we have the right combination of folks, I think, to continue on with this. Um, because Glacier gave us a copy of this preliminary report, which we could not distribute, uh, we digested it, had many comments and questions. Those comments and questions, I believe, were uh, distributed to the board. Uh, mm -hmm. Eric, true? Okay. Mm -hmm. And they were sent back to Dave Harris at, uh, uh, at Glacier. And to date, I don't think we've gotten a response from them, but we do have questions and comments on that. Okay. So what, what have we learned? We have learned that uh, we believe that Glacier will complete installation of meters for all use areas uh, this year, which means that they will finally be able to be collecting information on where the water that they produce goes. Very important. That usage data will be collected over a period of, uh, they said something like three to four quarters, and then that data will be folded into setting the new rate structure for everybody, for all of the users. Those new tiered rates should go into effect 
late 2019 or sometime in 2019 or 2020 after they've had a chance to, uh, to go through all of that. We also found out that there apparently is a new uh, entity, the Elbert Creek Water Company LLC that has been formed. There are some questions about transfer of um, water rights to this new entity and that's being investigated now as well. We don't yet uh, completely understand how all of that works. Uh, next slide, Gary. Okay, so some of the comments and questions. Um, we generally approve of, of the rate study approach. It, I think it has been long overdue and we're very happy to see it going forward. Um, as part of that, uh, Glacier has said that they need to build a reserve, uh, just as we, as Joe was talking about, and our finances, um, all entities in general should have reserve accounts, uh, so if that are hit with something, or if they have new capital investments that they need to make, the, the money is at hand. And we agree to that. Um, there is an issue that has to do with raw water. Raw water is used to irrigate the golf course, and it appears that that historically has been a significant fraction of the total expense. And because that is a glacier operation, um, it is our position as of now that that should be treated separately from the other water uh, that is delivered to all of the users. And so that's something we'll be, we'll be uh, negotiating in the future. Uh, we also noted that the report that they gave us did not break out in any way different types of users. For example, work condo community. There are single home dwellings um, throughout. There are other HOAs, there are commercial buildings that are served. So uh, we don't have yet have any details about how the rates would vary depending on the type of users or whether there would be different tier structures for, for everybody. So these are, we have many, many questions that yet uh, have to be resolved. Um, next slide. So um, I'll just summarize briefly. Um, the metering project uh, should be completed this year. The relative consumption data will factor into establishing more equitable rates for everybody. Uh, there will be significant capital expenditures. Dave uh, Dunn mentioned already that they're working on the water plant, and uh, this was kind of news to me, so uh, I want to get up to speed on that. Uh, but those capital expenditures to improve or replace um, uh, treatment facilities will be passed along to all the customers. We can expect that that's, that's normal. Um, and then there will be a reserve and, and the cost for building up that reserve will also be passed along to everybody, including us. Um, I think that's about it. I know because the, the water and sewer is such a large ticket item that I think what most owners want to know is, are we gonna, gonna get any relief and how much we have to pay? What are our new rates going to be? Well, we don't know that yet. Uh, it remains to be determined. Um, what I do believe, based on the progress that's been made, especially recently, is that we can look forward to community-wide uh, more equitable rates for everybody. What that will mean to us specifically, I don't know yet. Um, especially because there there were there are new capital projects going on, um, and uh, and other expenses, so don't uh, don't have answers for you on those issues yet. That's it. Did anybody? I know in January, I guess that's when we were here last. Uh, we talked about reaching out to the folks down the road in Rockwood. Did that ever happen? Um, partially. Okay. Um, Eric, I don't know if you can comment on that, or uh, I know somebody had has spoken to the folks down there. Um, but I don't, uh, I don't recall except a, a general statement that, that they thought that it would be good for everybody to share information about what, uh, how they've been charged. My recollection is that the, the specific question to be posed was water quality. And yes, those conversations did take place. Okay. Yeah. And incidentally, somebody did this morning ask about water quality. Right. Um, and so we have uh, we've talked about that a little bit. I, I will tell you from my own experience that you know the water up here is incredibly high, hard. It has high turbidity. Um, in some cases, I thought that I could even smell the water. And so we get periodically every year or two years, I believe, the reports from the state. It's supposed to be annual. It's supposed to be annual. <laughs> um, 
that whoever operates the plants need to monitor the quality of the water and report that to the state, and then uh, you, it's accessible um, by the public to see what it is. And every year we have been assured that the content of the water, uh, the impurities or, or whatever you want to call them, are below what uh, standards are uh, for the quality of the water. And um, I'm, I'm a scientist by nature. I was a little bit skeptical, so I bought my own um, water testing kit, and I tested water at, at our place up at, at High Point. And I found that, in fact, um, all of the things that I was in particular suspicious of, water, iron content, for example, were below what the federal standards were. So uh, I had no reason to doubt the, the reports. Um, we do have a lot of uh, stuff that is not dissolved in the water, there, as well as stuff that is dissolved. So, you know, we the the quality of the water here is, is an issue, and and I would hope that in what Glacier is doing with their new uh, treatment facilities, that that will be taken into consideration. Uh, we just installed uh, Culligan water softening and and uh, uh, filtering re reverse osmosis drinking water filter for our unit up there, uh, and <clears throat> the, uh, the quality of the water has improved significantly for what it's worth. Joe? You mentioned raw water and that we shouldn't be charged for raw water. Okay. I, what, how are they defining or how are... How are they defining raw water? That's almost question number one, I think, in, in what, what was sent to them. It, it, it's not it's not clear. Um, well, I made some notes. That, no pun intended. I made some notes. Let me let me just <laughs> let me let me tell you how confusing this can be. I, I just made these notes. What's the difference between raw water and wa and treated wastewater? Raw water is river water, creek water, and, our well, and water. well water. Right. Yep. Raw water feeds the water treatment plant, which then becomes drinking water. Yeah. But it also can feed the golf course directly. That's right. Treated affluent feeds only the golf course. Right. So it's, it, it's convoluted. And, and, and the study does not, at least the parts of the study that we saw, I think everybody would agree, didn't correctly reflect the makeup uh, of the real water yeah. as used. That's what, that's, yeah. that's, but I think that's because they don't know. I think those guys are, that, that was their first draft, and I, don't, I they didn't know. If we hadn't told them, I'm sure Glacier would have told them, that's not what really happens to the water here. Maybe they got raw water right. They, but they identified but, both in terms of, well, gallons produced or whatever. Uh, they distinguished between raw water and treated water, and then sewer was separate. So those are the three entities that, that they track costs for and they, and they give us cost information, but as Eric said. So the raw water can go, can feed the water treatment right. plant, which However, then we get, right. but it can also go to the golf course, right. which is not us. But I, what I can say, Joe, is that when they told us what the costs were associated with for each of those three components, it appeared that the raw water that went to the water treatment plant uh, was not was not included uh, in Sorry. That the that the raw water was was completely separate from what may have gone to the water treatment plant to produce the domestic. Yeah. Water. But again, we clearly have to ask more questions and, and get fair clarification. I just a question that dovetails to that: the 10% usage uh, by by Tamara is that treated water? Or is that include the raw water? That's, that's treated water. Just treated water. That's domestic. Water. water out so of the water out of the water out of the drinking water treatment plant. So yeah. again, uh, just to make sure it's clear to everybody, um, domestic water is what comes out of our taps and our houses, whatever. It's also what is used to irrigate uh, property back behind the gate. It's also uses what's used to irrigate property here. Uh, that now it is. It didn't used to be. Two years ago, it changed. Two years ago, and that's why we now. Why I said that the total, if you include the irrigation now, which is also domestic water, that means our total consumption is up at 14 point something percent um, out of the 50 million gallons that they produce of that water. Yeah, we should not be participating at all in treated affluent, moving treated affluent right. up to the ponds and to the golf course. Right. If, if we're paying for any of that, we shouldn't be. Right. 
including I the think, infrastructure that supports that. Or, or moving raw water from the river, I think it's only from the river, directly to the golf course, which I think it might get pumped to the ponds first and then go to the golf course, but I'm not sure how that works. And I don't know, yeah, I don't know how the land, the water that comes down from Electra Lake, I don't know where that goes. Is that That's Elbert Creek. That's Elbert Creek. Okay. But yeah, they, we, the, but they, they draw, do store water. They draw, they draw, Glacier draws a share of water from Elbert Creek right. that goes, I believe that all goes, that whole share goes to the water treatment plant. Okay. I don't think they have the capability of taking raw water from Elbert Creek and putting it in the ponds to go to the golf course. I think that only happens from the river. Okay. I'm not positive. Yeah. Well, and, and they did the golf course in at least two segments, too. So who knows what the... Uh, who knows? <laughs> Greg Drover. <laughs> Greg, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the right answer. Yeah. <laughs> Don't die, Greg. <laughs> yeah. but, but I think it's, yeah, there's two important points. I, we have started the dialogue. They have begun to share some information. I think both sides acknowledge that that information is pretty rough. Um, but as I think Jerry's trying to warn us, they are making new investments there. They're investing several million dollars on the backside and both through the reserves and through the recapture of that investment, our rates are more likely to go up than go down. Yeah, that's true. Just that's from 10,000 feet, but I don't want anybody to say, why didn't we know this was coming? You know? And we'll continue to work on it for sure. Um, it may not be in time, actually, to do our 2019 budget. We'll have to see about that. Any other questions online or audience for Jerry? Um, there is one online. This could take a while. <laughs> well, well, here, you take that one yeah. first? Yeah, take care. While he's, while he's perusing. What was your question, sir? Uh, Jerry? Jerry, I think you said that uh, the state requires a water quality report yearly, but well, I don't know that we have actually received a copy of the report on schedule every year. They eventually turn out. Um, we did see an indication that there were some minor um, monitoring, say, fractions, but they just they, they didn't report when they were supposed to have been, but they, they eventually showed. Is that online? Is that information available? Yeah, you can find it online. <laughs> Remember, but if you go to the state of Colorado, um, if you do some poking around on Google search, I think you'll be able to find it. In fact, I can try to dig up my link again. So Google it. Google. Thank you. The, 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 the annual report that they publish is it's on our website. It's in the, 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 we had to ask them for the most recent report. Yeah. because they forgot to give it to us. And um, by the way, uh, I noted that there was a slight difference in what we were given and what was on record at the really? state. Really? Well, I didn't notice that. There was a little bit at the end that. that was at the state but was not yeah. provided to us. Yeah. But we it's 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 a little bit delayed, Carrie. It's it's uh what's on the what's the the, the most recent report we have that it was coming year to year and Ken mentions Ken uh, uh Greg Drover, he always made sure that we got it on time, and but it, it, I guess it got it might have just fell through the cracks this last time, and it probably did. Um, but the most recent report we have was published last year for 2016. That's the most recent data we have. We don't have data for 2017 yet. In that in that that report for covering 2016 is on our website. It's on the glacier. It's on the Glacier Club page. Okay. We have our question yet? Mm, yeah. Okay, let's do this one first and then I'll come back, Diane. All right, this is from uh, Gus von Bolschwin. Um, I suspect from his presentation to all of us, spent, a little, spent long hours extensively gathering water usage among all the interested groups, TACO being one. The studies seem to indicate that we are being massively overcharged, perhaps by as much as 75% and if so, multiple millions over the past years. When I last talked to Jerry some months ago, he seemed to indicate that he has no longer been involved. Why not? Who is and what are we doing to reduce this 
$400,000 cost to us. Here, rather than a decrease, we actually incurred an increase this year. Why? Based on past patterns, won't the Glacier Club just drag out this ad, ad infinitum? As most of us would give the circumstances, as most of us would give, as, as most of us would given the circumstances. Next, we will probably hear about this. Well, I told you it would take a while. <laughs> Next, we will probably hear about all the capital involved improvement it needs to make not having not having maintained the facilities and so on. Are we having Mr. Golden at least initiate legal action to get this moving? I am a Glacier Club equity member. Wow. Well, there are lots of questions there. Let me let me try and highlight just just one, uh, and that is the the three percent raise ad infinitum. Uh, we have an agreement with Mr. Carlton that we will not see another increase in the rates until we have an agreement That's right. on what that rate should be, up or down. So it won't. This is the last year, and yes, we we did pay the piper this year to get that promise. You can argue that that was a good deal or a bad deal. We 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 made that deal, and and we opened the gates. I think for to start sharing some information. Because if we don't share information, we're never going to get to the bottom of this. I mean, Jerry can tell you how long he did spend in the dark with a flashlight trying to find data. And uh, I wish we'd had a lot more data. Maybe we wouldn't be here, but we, we don't. And so there were other questions. Jerry, maybe you remember some of them. Um, Jerry's not going away, by the way. Jerry's still head of the Water Committee. Um, not quite and, sure what that reference was. And, and to be fair to Gus, subsequently he wrote, "Okay, if, if you got a question for me on the water issue with Glacier Club, ignore it. Jerry Q2 just, just answered it. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry, sorry, Gus. I, I didn't see that until until afterward. Well, there's some good questions there, and I'm sure the audience is, everybody's interested in some of those. But, um so, is there another part there that you think we should address, Jerry? No, I, I think Gus kind of reflects what we've heard from many owners is that the frustration um, in getting movement on, on this issue for so long and um, maybe some cynicism about uh, you know people willing to actually uh, do something about it. Um, maybe I'm overly optimistic, but I, but I do see some progress and I I sincerely hope that it continues, and, and if it does, I think we'll be in much better shape. It may not be that our that our what we pay is any less, um, but at least we will have a, a better belief and understanding that uh, that the rates that everybody is paying are equitable, and that Taco or nobody else is sub subsidizing um, everybody else. Thanks, Jim. Diane, I'm sorry. I, I have a question that has to do with. The changes you said were two years ago. I've always heard it called gray water. Didn't we used to uh, irrigate um, lawns with gray? Did that come down from the state? Yeah, let me explain. There is um, a state statute that says that only under certain conditions can you use. Um, non-drinking water uh, for irrigation. Um, and we actually should have been required years ago to be doing our irrigation uh, with drinking water. And the reason is because um, <coughs> we cannot keep pets or children away from the irrigation spigots around the property where they could get something that might not be good for them. I this I'm privy. I'm just going to say here's a rumor <clears throat> that Dalton gets to use gray water on their leaves. Not all of you know that. No, I, I don't, but, but, but I'm, and Jerry, help me if I get this wrong, but my understanding is that the new state law basically says six or eight or ten feet from where people live, you cannot use gray water. It's a, it's a yardage. It's that kind of a regulation. So there may very well be parts of Dalton that are 25 feet away from. Dalton does not. Use so it, 
Oh, Dalton does not use. Okay. Okay. And, and she and lives there. Diane, <laughs> just a little, a little bit more. Um, we, yeah, we knew that in, in spite of the state law, that Glacier was using uh, treated effluent for water and golf course. So that meant that they needed some sort of waiver. In fact, I asked Dave Harris what they did to get their waiver and could we possibly get something like that so we could irrigate, continue to irrigate with that water. Mm -hmm. Um, what was explained to me is that they do have, um, they are excluded from that because, number one, they only irrigate at night, mm -hmm. and two, it is supposedly controlled access yeah. to the golf course where the irrigation goes on. So because of that, they are allowed to continue irrigating that. Now, we're being required to only irrigate. No, but I, I don't think that, uh, yeah, that, but that's for a different reason, right? That's for water conservation. Yeah, yeah. But, can, yeah. but if that's like a new really lot, then you still have a city if you're still close to home. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Jerry. Um, move next to. Uh, and we touched a little bit on this, but the fiber internet uh, oh. and the easement question, oh. why it's important. Okay, real quick. Yeah. Uh, we don't. There's no. Okay. I don't have say, it. You don't need that oh. slide. Okay. I, don't, I don't need that slide. <laughs> um, so we got a couple of components here that I, I guess myself and Eric and Jim are going to pass this between each other and, and tell you the whole situation on where we are with telecommunications um, and internet and, and cable slash satellite TV. So you all know that we entered into a contract last July with Groove Entertainment um, to, put, to provide satellite TV via DirecTV to provide and voice and data uh, via CenturyLink over a brand new, uh, from the source to the unit, fiber optic network. Um, subsequent to that signing of that, the agreeing and signing to that, co signing of that contract, Groove has backed off. You know this as well because it's been reported on before. Of this aspect of the, of the voice and data aspect of it due to access problems. Those access problems involve CenturyLink determining after the contract was signed and after Groove repeatedly confirmed with us that they did, they would have access, but they found out they didn't. Um, either via the currently installed conduits that could possibly be mined out and new fiber put in there, or via new fiber optic in conduit laid uh, essentially along the roads between our complexes and from Highway 550. The reason they found out they couldn't do that was that there are no easements for those utilities uh, in within the property. There is an easement from the Highway 550 to the lodge. We believe that we have that. It's it's on the plat, but there and it and the plat refers to uh, easements that would be there, could be there for the property as it might be expanded in the future. Now remember, these plats were put in place in 1974. So in 1974, Gamble Oak didn't exist, High Point didn't exist, Pinecone was under construction, so. The only thing that the developer actually put in place on the plat and got recorded was the highway to the lodge. So we've opened discussion with our, our attorney believes that we can get these easements uh, through legal through legal means, either by a declaratory judgment or by what's called an easement easement by necessity. Um, both of these. It's, it's complicated legally, but uh, both of them would give us the right to utilize uh, these easements wherever they lie. Again, most likely places along the roads. Um, 
But right now, Glacier is resisting uh, our efforts to secure these easements, either legally or by negotiating with them. Um, they've turned they've turned these discussions. These discussions were occurring between myself and Rick Carlton, with copies to Bill Grieco and Jim Finnegan. Uh, our attorney, Ken Golden, Eric's been involved, Jim's been involved. Um, recently, most recently, within the last week to 10 days, the communication has now gone between Ken Golden and uh, Glacier's attorney in the D.C. area. And there's been a back and forth there. Uh, again, some disagreement about whether or not these easements are available to us or can be can be. Uh, obtained by us, we, we continue to appeal to Glacier to work with us and grant us those easements, but again, so far they've been unwilling to do so. Um, what delayed, what's delayed the process is our attorney, Ken Golden, had a death in the family this last week, and he's traveling back from, uh, coincidentally, the D.C. area where he's from uh, today. And so he'll be back. Uh, he'll be back tonight, and then we have the holiday weekend. So probably sometime on Tuesday or beyond next week, we hope to uh, be able to respond to Glacier's request to have a dialogue on this. They have requested dialogue. We just couldn't get it done because because our attorney was out of pocket. Um, so that's basically where we stand on that now. We we feel that. If we present this to the courts properly, uh, we'll get the easements eventually. It may be a protracted process. We don't want to have it take a long time. We'd like to get it done sooner rather than later. That's why we've asked Glacier to uh, to be cooperative with us and, and, and work with us in the spirit of the community that they, they tend to uh, promote. So that's kind of what we're looking for. Eric, you anything? And Jim, any, Eric, you got anything to add? Yeah, I uh, the only thing I would say is, again, we think that the original documents in 1974 prescribed an easement. So there's no there's no granting, in our in, in the opinion of our attorney, that easement was granted in 1974. All we need to do is to one from the road to the to the to the lodge, lodge is in is granted. The one to the rest of the property is implied. Is is implied? Yeah. Uh, well, it's it's. It says for future developments. The I word that's implied, but yeah, it's but the wording it, isn't but, real definitive. But the it's not it's not directly reflected on the plat. It's right. only re referencing future development. You can't put it on a plat, so yeah. it's as it's as specific and as you can. And the future plats for those developments don't show the easements. Right. That's the yeah. that's the kind of the kicker. Right. And I mean, basically, but, what we're talking about is infrastructure, the ability to control our own destiny and our own costs by uh, having all of this conduit and wiring in space that we control and through PVC pipe that we own uh, versus paying somebody rent every day for perpetuity. Uh, we have paid Glacier the past 16 years for the privilege. Uh, we signed a 15 year contract. So we've, we've honored the contract. We've done what we said we would do. Um, and now we think in the best interests of this community going forward for the next 40 or 50 years, we owe it to all of you guys to do the best we can to control this little piece of our destiny. We, we won't control internet, we won't control television, that still comes through a third party supplier, but uh, we're talking about a relatively small amount of money to install this infrastructure that would last for 20 years versus paying well, at least the initial indications are a lot more money to uh, to use Glacier's uh, infrastructure. And so it's all about money. I mean, if you, if you haven't figured that out yet, it's all about money. And we feel, and our, and, our, and our attorney was the first one to bring this up, and Ken Golden, to his credit, he's really looking out for us all the time. And his, his attitude was, not only do we need to get this easement for now, but we need to get it for future generations, because right now we're handcuffed. We can't put wiring in the ground that completes a circuit throughout our four islands that are landlocked in the Glacier property. We're we're kind of stuck, and so that's that's what we're trying to do and for now and for the future. 
right. for future generations who might sit at this table and in that uh, in that audience. So, yeah. And that segues right into you, Rick, Eric. Okay. Well, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna start back at the beginning when where, where Joe did and go in a slightly different direction. As he said, we signed a contract last July uh, with a company by the name of Group Communications, and we expected them to install all three facets of what we call our communications plan. That's direct TV, uh, internet, and phone. Uh, our experience, respectively, was that buying a bundled package uh, of those services was, was the most effective and the most cost effective, because that's, respectively, where we live. That's kind of the way those services were provided. Um, as it turned out, Groove was not able to do everything, and particularly relying on a third party, uh, CenturyLink, to provide some of those services. They have defaulted on the contract. I mean, that's just that's. Then they agreed to that. They have been unable to to honor their contract. Um, they then tried a little segue uh, because they came to us and said, "We can't we can't perform." We said, "Well, you guys need to try a little harder." So then they went off and tried to work out a partnership with Glacier because Glacier controls these little pipelines that they couldn't get their hands on. Um, they put together a proposal that came back to us. The negotiating team and the, the board rejected that proposal uh, because it failed to meet any of the three <coughs> criteria, the important criteria that we had achieved with Groove. Um, those three criteria were to get services at market price, uh, to get a chance to provide 21st century infrastructure to the owners who live here as opposed to 1960 technology or 1980 technology. Um, and and uh, what was the third one? F uh, to gradually achieve taco ownership of the, the wires, the capability. So not just the, the uh, easements, but the wires themselves that deliver the services. To get us out of jail. To, 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 yeah, to control our own <laughs> destiny. Um, and we think those are important for us for the next, a long time. For all, anybody who lives here, and if you're selling next month, it's important for you to have that, your, your buyer to have that. Um, so the, our attorney believes um, contract law will conclude that Groove materially breached their contract. I'm not, I'm not an attorney and I'm not going to pretend to be an attorney, but Groove screwed up, okay? And, and they have some, some responsibility, some liability for that. So the question that we as a board have, as a negotiating team, is what do we do with that? Um, there are three things or more that we can, we can do. We can try and force them to install something they say they can in, in, install. We can seek financial damages in court, uh, which would involve a lawsuit in contract law in the state of Utah. Uh, which would involve finding another attorney because our attorney doesn't practice in Utah. Um, or, or we can find a commercial compromise that has benefits for both parties. Um, as a board, we prefer to avoid lawsuits. We don't think we serve you guys very well by spending money with Ken. We like Ken a lot, but frankly, paying litigation expenses on an uncertain outcome is not a very good path. Uh, we would like to find a commercial solution. Um, we've struggled with that. We've gone around and round. But I will say in the last 10 days, we have identified a possible concept. And I'll just use the word concept, uh, which we have discussed with Groove. Uh, and we are awaiting a more detailed response from them. Um, there is no assurance this concept will proceed. And there's no assurance of what that timeline may be. Um, I will simply say that at this point, we're trying, between what Jim's doing and what we're doing with Group, we're trying as many different options as we realistically can to, to solve this dilemma, to get better service and hopefully better pricing uh, for all three of these communications. Um, I can tell you personally, and on behalf of Joe and the rest of the board, I'm truly sorry that this thing uh, failed. We signed a contract in good faith, and I think we really thought we had the right answer and, the, and a good solution for this whole community. Uh, I can tell you that nothing has consumed more of our time, more of our lives, and probably more of our spouse's uh, goodwill than, uh, than this issue has over the last year. Um, and we're not done. We've got a lot of expertise, and I think we've got a little momentum. Um, but I can do no more than promise that we're working at it and ask for your patience. Um, 
we have some creative ideas, but nothing that's close to being enacted yet. <coughs> so that's where we are with group. Any any questions? Any from the board? Any questions from the audience? Uh, it's not so much a question. Uh, having been with AT and T in Florida for a long time, nobody seems to be doing hard wires. And I'm wondering if, if you're the, the uh, innovative uh, uh, method you had, are you considering is wireless communication? It's on the list, but to be honest with you, the geography works against us. In Florida, where you have nice flat land with not so many trees, not so bad. Uh, trying to get a, tr a signal from Gamble, the high point, is nigh on impossible. <laughs> There's no, there, it's been looked at. There's no line. Of, the line of sight's not there. Yeah. We'd have to erect 150 foot towers. On Golden Creek. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, and I guess we didn't really start with that, but I hope everybody understands that we're basically four islands. Everything between the complexes was, was deeded to Glacier. They bought it years ago, and, and, and that's just the life that, that we inherited. That's where we are, and so we've, we're trying to find a way to connect those islands so that we can provide one package of service to everybody. As Joe s s suggested, supplying this building appears to be easier than supplying the outlying units, but that's not the solution that we're looking for at the moment. One of the other things we wanted to update you on is that we have talked to other suppliers besides group to again find out what the marketplace looks like and to see if there's a different way to skin this cat, as they used to say. Um, and Jim is going to talk about that. So we're seeking uh, other direct TV provider services and dish services to um, basically duplicate what Groove had committed to providing. And essentially, it's the same hospitality solution that are the resort community services that Groove provided or proposed. And these are basically standard products offerings from uh, satellite providers, <coughs> TV and DISH. Um, and Gary, you're showing up. The um, scope objectives are very similar to what Groove had provided in their solution. Um, and these are and we are continuing with these same objectives. Um, with the exception of pricing, we're hoping we can get um, at least comparable or less pricing from these providers. For voice and internet, we are uh, reviewing proposals provided by CenturyLink and Brain Brainstorm. Brainstorm is a local uh, Durango firm. Um, their parent company is Forthought out of Denver. And their scope objectives are basically the same as um, what we had uh, been proposed to by Groove. And um, so our plan is to have the same objectives, um, only different providers than a single provider as, uh, as we had planned before. The cable TV portion would be satellite, and the voice and internet would be uh, cabling, uh, fiber optic cabling from Highway 550 uh, into each of the units in the condo communities. So, any questions? Okay. Um, again, I, I think we are looking for any kind of a reasonable commercial solution. Um, if there's a you know, an opportunity to work with Glacier uh, on this one, uh, and we've got other issues that we would like to work with them on, and other issues we've worked successfully with them on. Um, we're open to that. Um, at this point, um, they don't seem to be in any hurry to respond. Uh, that's because they get a check from us every month, um, and um, so um, it's it's probably not realistic to expect that they're going to be in a hurry to, uh, to take away that source of revenue to them. Um, can't say that I blame them for that, and they're not making, doesn't make them the opponent or the enemy or any of that kind of stuff. Uh, in their best interest, they want to collect money as long as they can. In this particular point, our interests aren't totally aligned, so we're trying to find our own path. Okay.
Any anything else on the, inter the communications package? You can. Um, okay, the last item on the agenda: uh, rental program and our publicity effort. Mr. Gillen. Yeah. So, um, Heather, I'll kind of go through the publicity thing, and then if anything you want to add, I'll, I may ask you to chime in. Okay. Um, in the G in January board meeting, um, I had a you know, inquired about uh, what we needed to do now that we had the golf course amenity or the golf course online, the, the uh, amenity center coming online, uh, really in an effort to reestablish Tamron's rental program, reestablish the visibility of what we have here, uh, really recognizing that we've kind of been off the grid for about 18 months with everything going on in the lodge. Uh, we've been limited on what we've been able to do. Uh, we've lost some, um, uh, some repeat business because the pool not being available. Uh, so we felt like it was uh, it was time to maybe revisit that. Uh, last year we had talked to Ann Dixon, who was on the board, uh, who is a local. Um, uh, she runs a local marketing group uh, here in Durango uh, to kind of volunteer her services to get that done. She sold her unit, uh, so uh, we contacted her to see if she would be interested in uh, helping us out from a contract perspective and really looking at what we needed to do to improve our online presence uh, to improve uh, and look at our website and uh, uh, I'm talking about the Tamron Vacation Rentals website uh, as well as uh, you know what we needed to do to get more exposure through social media uh, and other means. So we uh, entered into contract with her I think the first month was February uh, and the first thing we really focused on we've come doing been doing this in phases uh, the first thing we, we focused on was the uh, was the uh, Tamron rental uh, website. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, um, the association bought the, the original LiveRes software uh, that we have been leveraging that runs that website. Uh, it was bought seven or eight years ago, Heather, is that about right? Uh, so we've been operating uh, with, um, with this technology. Uh, in digging into it, we discovered that uh, we have what's, what was called a non-responsive site. Uh, what that means um, in you know, tech speak is Basically, uh, it goes to the bottom of the ranking in Google searches. Uh, it has no uh, ability to, to have a, a presence uh, by a, you know, a cell phone or, or a tablet or anything like that. So we had really the lowest common denominator website, which probably was not that case you know, not you know, seven, eight years ago. But given current technology, uh, that's what we had. So uh, we did the research, uh, made a determination that, that we needed to upgrade uh, that website. Uh, so that was... The first effort, and that just went online Wednesday. Yesterday. Yesterday. Okay. So, uh, for those of you who haven't looked at um, uh, the Vacation Rentals website, take a look at it. You can pull it up on your phone now. Flows a lot better. All new pictures, um, and it, it really is 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 very impressive. We've got social media presence tied to that. Um, we did a new Facebook page, uh, which uh, we have had a Facebook page for a very long time. I think when we looked at the Facebook page back in February, we might have had. I don't know, 50 or 60 people that uh, had liked it or joined it. Uh, we're up to, what, 380, 350, something like that yeah. um, as of today. Uh, so we, we revamped that. Uh, the other thing we started in February was doing um, what's called targeted, targeted advertising. So for any of you that aren't familiar with targeted advertising, uh, basically uh, Facebook allows for you to do some sponsored ads, and you can pick – uh, the demographics you're looking to reach, the area you're looking to reach, the type of people you want to reach, uh, and uh, you can target those ads, and you basically pay per per um, per people you reach. So it's it's extremely inexpensive. It's kind of um, uh, a new way of of having really focused uh, and targeted uh, campaigns that you can do to try to reach out to people and make them aware of Tamaron and and its amenities and whatnot. Historically. What we've mainly done is local ads. Um, what this was done was was really intended to target uh, specific events that were going on around to, uh, around Durango uh, and uh, and do posts really in the surrounding area. So we started in February. Uh, we did I think four campaigns. One was uh, uh, around the graduation housing, uh, which was local here, just post local here. Uh, we did a posting for the Iron Horse, uh, which is this weekend. Uh, we reached 1,138 people for that. Uh, it was like it would cost us $2.55 to reach 1,138 people. 
Uh, we did a, a post for the Durango bluegrass meltdown, which was that in April? When was that? It was in April. Uh, we reached 1,286 people, uh, and that cost us $20. Uh, we did a spring break post, um, uh, and it was really focused on uh, trying to get people up here for spring break. Uh, and that ex had expressed interest in, uh, we did ages 18 to 55, living in Utah, New Mexico, and Arizona, uh, that expressed interest in outdoor activities or skiing. So they're very targeted uh, targeted efforts. Uh, between February and March, we did uh, two rounds of posts. I think we did a, a some in April too, but I, I didn't get the report yet on that. Um, I think so far we've might have spent $110 uh, doing targeted posts, $125 maybe. Um, uh, but we've uh, we, we've reached uh, a, a lot more people. We've got a lot more likes on our Facebook page. And, and really, that's kind of the, grass, the way grassroots marketing is working today. Using social media, we've got uh, we've updated our Twitter activity. We've updated our Instagram uh, activity as well as our Facebook activity. So, yes, ma'am. Excuse me one second. I'm jumping ahead. But have you gotten a return in reservations from those it's people? Very you difficult. It's very difficult. It's tough to track because we don't, you know, being able to say, I'm responding to this particular post that you did in February and I, and I booked a room. What we are seeing is an increase in activity. Uh -huh. um, uh, we're looking to update the Facebook page there. You can actually do a booking functionality within the Facebook page, which will give us a little more ability to track. Yeah, that's what it's um, You know, at the end of the day, there's, there's not a really, there's not an easy way to correlate that somebody came up specifically other than through maybe campaigns or surveys. In mm -hmm. addition to that, uh, Heather has had a lot of conversations with Glacier, and I'll let you fill this in, Heather. But but basically, Glacier's been very cooperative with us on coming up with golf packages and uh, things that we can advertise collectively uh, with them, so that we can get people up here uh, and have golf packages as well. You want to maybe speak a little bit to that, Heather? Yeah, I've had quite a few meetings. Um, Ken's been in on some. Um, Jim Finnegan, Josh from the Golf Shop, Jeff Carmel, Jeff who's running their event center. Um, so we've been able to. For example, utilize some really nice golf photos for advertising. We've been able to put together a golf package that's advertised um, through the Gateway reservation system in town and kind of puts together package uh, stays. So, for example, we have a stay and play package, you know, much like we have a stay and ride the train package. It's there's a little bit of discounts built into some things. Um, you know, they're working closely with Carmen. They're doing a bunch of weddings next door. Um, so she obviously refers those wedding groups to us for <coughs> guest stays. So I think I'm working with her on maybe 10 different weddings this summer. And before, maybe I would be working on one wedding this summer if it was being held, you know, down here uh, in the private clubhouse. So I think we're definitely going to see, you know, some increases. And, I, and obviously now I'm starting to be able to advertise an opening date um, for the pool and fitness center amenities. So it's been real easy working with that group. I think it's all been positive. And, you know, we're just really making sure that what I'm saying is okay with, with you know, how their brand needs to be. And um, I just think it'll, it'll be obviously a, a boost for us. It might take us a little bit to get re ramped up. Because, um, like Scott did say, we did lose some repeat groups and, and things with the closures. But hopefully with some of these Facebook campaigns and the website ranking higher, you know, hopefully those people are looking back on our site and seeing that we've got all this stuff reopened back up again. So. Yeah, so here's the, the new website here. Um, and you'll notice the flowing pictures. Uh, we got cooperation from the, uh, from the railroad. We've got uh, pictures that Glacier provided, that DMR provided, or Purgatory provided. Um, so we've, we've really kind of stepped up uh, the website presence uh, that we have out here. Obviously, they can uh, uh, consumers can book and, and search directly online uh, with that. Uh, so it's a it's a it's a much improved website. Uh, we're hoping you know certainly that will help. Will help. We um, we did some additional social media posts around uh, the Taste of Durango. Uh, we did some special promotions with uh, Purgatory with a free lift ticket. So we we're trying to get creative with the posts to get activity. So. You know, really, right now we're just coming out of phase one. We've got the website, we've got the, you know, we've got a responsive site now. Now we'll start working uh, with with Google to try to get our um, our rankings higher up. Uh, funny enough, Gary's site actually had better Google rankings than than the rental site, and it's primarily just because of the technology that we were leveraging. We weren't we weren't getting any boost from it. So now that we have 
the website on board uh, and, and online, I should say. Uh, kind of the next phase is, is really to, to focus more on how do we track bookings if we can. Um, Heather's got some plans to do some surveys specifically with renters that come in, try to figure out exactly how, uh, how they got referred to us. Uh, another big part of this is getting kind of the comments and the, and the um, uh, you know, the uh, various, uh, what's, what was the, I think I wrote it down, TripAdvisor, things like that, trying to get those kind of comments cleaned up. We got comments out there that are, you know, seven years old. Uh, so hopefully those surveys will allow us to get people to go, you know, go out and like our page, like us on Instagram. Uh, we've just got to begin to, to, um, to generate more traffic. Um, any of you that play on social media at all, if you've got Facebook pages or Instagram or anything, please go in and like the page because this, again, this is, this is about spreading, uh, spreading the word through a network uh, and not leveraging traditional uh, advertising campaigns to do so. And, you know, I think we've, we're, we're off to a good start. Um, Anne is, um, we've got her under contract, I think, in, through September. So we'll be moving into kind of phase two now, and she'll be helping us boost uh, those posts. And we'll continue, you know, to look forward, uh, you know, three to six months out on activities that are going on in town and, and continuing to uh, do targeted advertising around those activities. And hopefully we can, you know, pick up some, uh, uh, you know, not just the activity around the golf, uh, but you know, you know, our, our, our shoulder periods are terrible, but there are activities that go on here. I just don't think we've ever, we don't, we don't advertise them. We don't talk about them. So the more people we have liking this, the more activity we have on it, uh, you know, hopefully we pick up some incremental rentals as it, as it relates to that. And I think so far as, you know, Joe alluded to, we're seeing some, some good activity. We think there's a, a connection there, but it's, it's tough to, tough to know for sure. So that's, that's an update there. Do you want to add anything specific to the rental program, Heather? <clears throat> Um, no, just kind of along with phase two, you kind of mentioned it, but we will be starting to auto send um, guest surveys to folks who have departed, and then those, um, and that'll include some reviews. So we'll see the reviews page update there as soon as we start getting those uh, sent out and, and being returned. So um, all those kind of things help boost, you know, rankings and visibility, you know, some of the stuff we have on there is, but reviews are old because there were things that we had to manually type in based on a, a guest handwritten comment card. So just getting stuff like that updated. Yeah, and the comment Gary made earlier, I think applies here as well. This, you know, we have a responsibility as owners here to, to try to help boost this, right? If, if you're active at all, uh, if, you know, if, if, if you are just because you want to see kid, pictures of the kids, Get it out to them. Get them to like it. You know, this is this is all about growing that network. Um, a lot of us, you know, aren't overly active. I was pretty much clueless when I got onto this. I just that's why we asked uh, asked for the help. Um, and we've learned a lot about you know why we uh, why we had the rankings we did as a result. So I think as we move into the, the phase two, um, this is you know we should see a lot more activity from it. Right. Um, Scott and and Heather, as a participant in the uh, rental program, I want to thank you for your efforts. Um, very impressed. I've got two questions though. Number one, who owns the website? The website, we own the software and you own the URL. Is that correct? Yeah. So it's a combination. Yeah. Secondly, one of the greatest things that we found in our retail years is that signage is very important. And I recall from the last meeting, the discussion with Carlton was to include the question of signage. I wonder where we stand on that issue. Uh, we had a call with Carlton. You talked about signage on the road. The yes, wood sir. Side they took down up front. Um, yes, sir. I mean, it two, si two signs. Members, but. We were we were on the big wooden sign, and we were also at the at the entry sign, and we have no presence there at all now. Yeah, we had a call with Carlton, and the impression I we got from that call is he was willing to discuss getting the signs back up in, in some areas. I, admittedly, it took us a while to get to that point with him, but I think he did agree to it. Is that was a your recollection? I think that's a fair statement. Yeah, I, I, I would count it more that in the agreement that we signed, Taco and Glacier agreed to common landscaping, common signage within the property, and not in the agreement, but we also talked about the signage on the road. And Rick basically said, we're going to put together a plan and bring it to you. Yeah. And I think the only reason we don't have that yet 
is because it's all hands on deck over yeah, there. Everybody who's got an hour to spend is spending it on the fitness center because they're a little bit behind schedule. Would you agree with that, Ken? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, so it, it has slipped. I mean, it should have been done last year, to be quite honest, if you if you read the agreement literally. Yeah. But Well, we had to re we had to rebudget the landscape money for this year because it didn't get done last year. Right. But I don't think I don't think the the intent hasn't gone away. The timing has just been overtaken by other things that have a higher priority. And so, you know, we will. Joe and I are both here just on property now. We will remind Rick and his staff in the next couple of weeks that this was part of our discussion, and we're still waiting for that plan, um, and, and in a polite way. And I think, I mean, we want our money. They would be happy for us to help them with some of the landscaping. So I, I'm, you know, I'm very impressed with their upgrade of their signage without mm -hmm. without doubt but the removal of ours is and i don't care what we're called glacier or tamron frankly i you know i have no no love for one or the other but i'd like to know who i am and if we're trying to rent our properties under the tamron name when they come up the road they ought to see something other than a blue sign and we were very clear with rick on the call that hey we we exist as tamron we want to have a discussion around a different name at some point. That's a discussion. That's not that's not where we're at today. We have a website that says Tamron. We have a sign in the front that says Tamron. Um, you know, I, it would probably take all of us three years to not even reference Tamron if we change the name tomorrow. Uh, so it's not something you just change like that. So I think, I mean, we're in agreement. Uh, the signage needs to go back. It's just a function of timing. Any other questions? Yeah, Jim. Yeah, just one quick comment. Um, I've noticed when I've done internet transactions, very often uh, as part of the transaction, they will query you, how did you find out about us? There's a little drop down list where you can do that. Um, is that something that you we, might be able to do? We actually do have that. It's just very difficult to fill that out. So it's been there forever. It's just seldom used. Yeah, we got. I think yeah, at the end of the day, we need to experiment with do we send out a preliminary survey asking about it, you know, when you book a reservation, how you found out about us? Do we? It's probably a combination of a lot of different angles, doing something up front, front asking questions when they come in, setting up an exit survey, uh, to, you know, to really try to, uh, you know, to get them involved. And we want them to come back and, and give us a positive review and do a like and everything else that we so need. So also a kind of a follow-up to that, um, when anybody books rental here, do they, do you ask them for an email contact? Address. It's a required field. It's required. And is there a provision that you have the rights then to send them uh, by email? I've done Anything? blast emails before to past guests. Um, it's a little bit labor intensive. So what we're working on now is the auto, uh, the way to auto do it, the auto departure type survey. But the system we also upgraded to will allow me to do glass much easier than I have to pass. So I don't want to bombard people like every week with something, but it'll just make it less of a time consuming task. But we certainly want to, you know, you want to look at things like that. You know, you've got people that came to ski. Well, you should probably hit them in September or so saying, hey, you're going to come up and ski again? So I think, you know, we've got to get to a point where we have a cadence like that. And, you know, as we, understand the functionality of the website, I think we'll get there. Yeah. Just one other point, and, and again, since our business participates in this, I don't, I'm not happy with it, but it's something that our franchisor foists on us as all other fast foods. Every single receipt that you receive encourages you to respond in form of a survey, just with a telephone call. And, and we pay for that in the form of free food. I don't know if there's any consideration with with some discount at, at yellow carrot or some cooperation with uh, with the, the mine shaft over there or not that that would be a possibility to encourage responses um, you know for us unfortunately a lot of people do it just to get free food yeah. but I don't think somebody's going to travel all the way up here just to get a free beer at, at the mine shaft or a, they've already left <laughs> right so. but but I'm saying that, that that type of encouragement might be worth consideration. Yeah, yeah. Again, if any creative ideas anybody has, we're we're certainly open to it. This is. This There's is, obviously things we could do, like, you know, hey, you're a fast guest. 
if we book with us again during these time periods, we'll give you a 10% discount or something yeah. like that. Didn't you do something like that on one yeah, night free, for three nights, and you get one night free? or right? in an empty room. Like And it could be if you return the survey, you know, you can have a discount on your or something. Any other questions? Well, thank you, Scott. I think I think we all benefit. I think you know, certainly some of it is focused on the rental program. Um, but if, if you're like me and like a lot of folks that I know, the first time you set foot on this property, you were probably spending a night as a guest in traveling and um and made an indelible impression and you came back and you bought here and then I'm I would guess twenty five percent of the people that eventually bought in Glacier lived or bought owned here before they moved to Glacier. So um, it helps the whole community and I appreciate Scott what you're doing to help bring targeted audiences here. Yep. It's dynamite. Hope it works. Okay, I think we've reached the point where everybody gets to take a break. Unless we have any other questions, to feedback about the meeting or whatever. I think we're adjourned. Can I say oh, something else? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not till we clear you, you the can, room. You can say, it. will you guys make a motion to adjourn? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Prisby. Um, th this goes back to what Scott said early on about there being things to do here, even during the shoulder seasons. For those who haven't done it yet, and I, and I know that Heather has a list of uh, different events and everything. On the news and events page of our website, if you scroll down, and I don't know who has done this and who hasn't, but there is a link right here that I put in. says there are all kinds of reasons to spend more time with Tamron, not the least of which is Durango itself. If you click on that link, here's a list of Durango events just for 2018 that I pulled from several different websites. And you can go down, and there are links to those websites down at the bottom. They have a much more extensive list. But if you're wondering what's going on in Durango at some time where you're thinking, maybe I'll go up, maybe I won't, go to this list, go to the, the links from downtown, and you'll find stuff to do. There's always stuff to do here. Yeah, and you spent some time talking with Ann about this, right? Because at some point we need to talk about how do these sites intertwine each other. I think we've kept them separate intentionally. Yeah, but... yeah. I haven't talked to Ann about that in okay. particular, um, but sharing some information, yes. So we're all fully aware. I hope the DMR is just momentarily getting ready to open a major slide that they've installed up there that should extend their season and perhaps ours, and we should be pushing it. I mean, it's the it's the largest, longest uh, rattling slide I think that that's available on the market. This guy is evidently very aggressive. The owner up there. It's on. It's on. It's, a, it's like it's a roller coaster. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's called the monster or something. Yeah. yeah. They have them all over Europe. It's a we metal, get to, it's we a get metal to ride it with our pass? Uh, you do. Yeah. Do you? Yeah. Well, you get a alter, discount if you have a pass. The summer pass. You get a discount if it's you get a It's about a $20 one trip ride, or yeah. you can buy a separate $127 annual pass for that. But I think you get a discount if you've got well, that all inclusive. I have an all season pass. All right. You need to buy something else, but it's very reasonable. You need to look at because they changed the all season pass structure. Well, they didn't. They didn't let summer months this year. There was a couple of things you had to pay extra for on the all season pass. Yeah, if you already paid for it, then you probably. And this is this is a twelve season thing up there. It'll run in the winter. Oh really? Don't know how. Yeah, it's a mountain coaster. Yeah, check that out. I didn't know it would run in the winter. Didn't look like it was high enough. If we got a good snow. I can say it only runs when it's not snowing. Okay, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Okay. We have a motion, Ron. Second. Boyd. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. We are adjourned. Good